Scare Podcast listener, and welcome to What Scares Us, a podcast where four friends share the movies that freak us out. Brought to you by the Ann Arbor District Library. I'm Allison. I'm Amanda. I'm Christopher. And I'm Matt. And today we're talking about Nope, the 2022 neo-Western science fiction horror film written and directed by Jordan Peele. Nope was shot by cinematographer Hoyta Van Hoytema and produced by Jordan Peele and Ian Cooper under Monkey Paw Productions. It stars Daniel Kaluuya and Kiki Palmer as horse wrangling siblings attempting to capture evidence of a UFO. Stephen Yun, Brandon Perea, Michael Wincott, and Keith David appear in supporting roles. I have a couple fun facts to get us started. It grossed $171.2 million worldwide. It was the first horror movie to be filmed with IMAX cameras. Cinematographer Hoyta Van Hoytema innovated a new way to shoot day for night by shooting in infrared and on 65mm film at the same time, with the two cameras aligned to shoot the exact same image at the exact same time. And then those two sets of images were mixed. And our final fact, the movie was totally snubbed by the Oscars, a fact that I personally feel is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> was this anybody's first time seeing it? I think no. Nope. Got to see it in the theater. <laughs> what was your first time watching like? I loved it. Yeah? Yeah, it was it was so beautiful. And I think from the very first opening shot, it's like you think, Wow, I mean, for a different kind of a movie. Yeah. My first experience, um, unfortunately, I watched it at home. Um, I really wish I had seen it in theaters because it definitely seems like it would have benefit from that experience. But I remember when it came out, I think it was like, it still felt like it was maybe too early to go to a movie theater for me, just Mm. based on the COVID stuff. Yeah. Um, Which now feels like a a bad excuse. Yeah. I fell asleep the first time I watched it, actually. So there were a couple of things that were new to me this time, <laughs> uh, which is not a strike on the movie. I just think, I, I, if I remember correctly, I watched it pretty late at night. Yeah, and I've seen it, watching it again for this, this was my third time seeing it. And I did get to see it in the theater. And I haven't, same as you, Matt, I haven't been seeing a lot of movies in the theater. I kind of, I used to do it all the time. So my family was going to another movie that I didn't want to see or... And then I was like, no, Nope is out. I'm going to go see Nope. And so it was amazing to see on the big screen, just the colors, the sound. And then I watched it again when it came out on Blu-ray and I watched the extra footage or the extra, the bonus features. And it was fun to watch it again the second time because you process it a little bit differently or think about Mm -hmm. things or notice things that weren't in the first one or the first viewing. And then... I just did a breezy watch to watch it again for the podcast because I feel like I just watched it like four months ago. So I really didn't really... Wasn't in the mood to watch Nope this past week to get ready for this podcast, um, but that doesn't say anything in relation to how I how much I like the movie and it's a great movie. But it's also one where you kind of have to be in the mood for it to kind of sit down and think and view and take it all in. I was really glad I was able to see it in the theater. So I kind of felt the same way, even though I super super love this movie. Where I saw it in I saw it in theaters in July when it came out, mm-hmm. and I was lucky enough to see it in IMAX. Um, which was really great because I don't know how this makes sense, but I noticed some things kind of in the background that I didn't notice when I saw it again in theaters uh, the next month. Um, I also, I didn't fall asleep the first time, but I did the second time because I <laughs> secretly had COVID that I picked up at Universal Studios. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I have to admit, I fell asleep the second time <laughs> I watched the movie, so... Uh, this is maybe not boding so well for our movie pick today. <laughs> well, I, was, th- sure. I did not fall asleep the first two times I watched it, but when I was rewatching it, because you, you don't start watching it at 11 p.m. at night, right, you didn't have to break right. it up. So, but I historically, if I try to watch something at home on my couch, and if it's after 8 p.m., I will fall asleep, no matter what it is or how great it is. Even if it's a show, I'm dying to see how it's gonna, what happens, gonna happen next. I will fall asleep. Well, there's also so many points in this movie where it is very, very dark. So it's really yes. easy to shut your eyes yeah. at that point. <laughs> it's also it's hypnotizing and mesmerizing. So yeah, I don't think that says anything about how we truly feel about the movie. Right. No. <laughs> nope. We're just really good sleepers. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. The movie starts with the Universal logo and dialogue from Gordy's home playing in the background. We see a quote that reads, I will cast abominable filth at you, make you vile, and make you a spectacle. 
We see a shoe standing straight up at an impossible angle and a bloody chimpanzee walking around a destroyed film set. Eventually, the chimp looks directly at us. We cut to Haywood Hollywood Horses, where we watch various farm work take place. Horses run around, and we hear over the radio that the search for local missing hikers will resume today. We meet O.J. and his dad, who chat about the current state of their family business. O.J. starts to walk back to the house when suddenly he and his dad hear a strange noise in the distance. Small objects begin falling from the sky. O.J. turns around and sees that his father has been severely injured by one of the falling objects. He rushes him to the hospital, but his dad doesn't make it. O.J. returns to the farm and sees a key embedded in one of the horses. We cut to the title card and credits playing over a strange square blue something moving slightly. Uh, Chimpanzee attacks. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's some of the scariest shit I can possibly think of. Yeah. I think of of the movies we've watched so far, I I think as the idea of that is maybe the scariest thing. Yeah. Um, Because I remember when I was a kid, my mom was watching some sort of Oprah where they had someone on, one of those stupid people who will think that they can have a chimpanzee as a pet. Mm -hmm. Um, But actually it was a friend of someone who went over to visit her friend that had a chimpanzee and it fundamentally changed her life, like ripped her hands off, broke her jaw, like she had no face. Like chimpanzees are scary to me. Um, So that, that was a really, really tense, frightening thing to see at the beginning of this movie that is otherwise not, not particularly scary to me. No. But um, but that idea is terrifying. Just the camera's approach to that scene is so amazing. And then those periodic balloon pops really bring you into that scene in a horrific way. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I think the other thing that I noticed about this very beginning is we are getting set up to make sure that we pay attention Mm -hmm. to things happening in the background. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is maybe one of the more obvious things when we see the applause sign going on and off, but it gets more and more subtle, but I think you're really rewarded for paying attention. So in one scene, we see the objects that have fallen from the sky that are pinned to um oj's wall Mm -hmm. you see the the bag there up into the wall and there are just so many many times when you have to look in the background and i i thought it was great and we see that we're set up from the very beginning Mm -hmm. of the movie to do that yeah and since it does start once we get to the um the horse ranch with oj and his father we're set up it's very it starts very quiet and you know what you're getting into. You're okay. This is a this is a more quieter movie. OJ's not saying a lot. There's a lot going on, like emotion, um, and then the sounds. You're paying attention to the sounds. You're immediately in this 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 like calm, quiet world of suspense because you don't know what's going on. So even if in subsequent watches you still have that feeling, but the first time is amazing. So if anybody's listening. And you haven't seen it yet, stop and go watch it. Oh, yeah. And put your phone away because there's yes. no way that you can, if you look away for a second, mm-hmm. you're going to miss something, <laughs> whether it's totally innocuous or it's or it's really important or it's a yeah. little reference. It's it, also beautiful. So why would you want to miss a single scene? But from, from the very opening shot as the camera's going into the studio, it is so lush and beautiful, mm-hmm. isn't it? I mean, you see all of the control panels on the right side, and then you see all those plants, and it's 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 just gorgeous. This cinematographer has pretty much only made really, really, really beautiful stuff. Interstellar, Her, Spectre, oh. Dunkirk, um, Tenet, uh, at Astro, which is not great, but it's at least pretty. <laughs> um, I think, uh, is it Ad Astra? Ad Astra? Ad Astra, yeah. Ad Astra. yeah. I think that's where he sort of started to develop the um, day-to-night stuff. The other thing that the beginning sort of does is um, I started paying attention to the dialogue. Like, I feel like every little bit of dialogue is super meaningful, but you don't really know yeah. what the thing behind it is until you've seen the whole movie. Um, 
So like OJ's dad says, keep our heads up off the clouds for this one. If we land it, if we really put on a show, Mm -hmm. you know, they're going to bring us back for the sequel. Um, We don't have to sell any more horses. So just execute and there won't be any more problems. (laughs) Like so many little things in that that are just like wrapped into the dialogue. Um, The other thing that freaked me out on a second watch was um, when Gordy comes back after he's um, attacking the dad actor, there's a lampshade that he sort of brushes by and it rolls around and it looks just like Jean Jacket. There's like so many little, so many little Easter eggs. I didn't catch that. Were you able to watch the extras on the Blu-ray to see how that scene was filmed? They're amazing. They show the whole scene. But um, they show the actor, Terry Notary, and he's, um, like, in the same little weird outfit that Gordy is in. But he has these really cool, long, like, elongated metal arms to have, like, a better... Um, it's like the motion capture of his body being, like, the size of a chimpanzee. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, I got really caught up this time, uh, like, oh, can... Can a coin actually like go into your head at terminal velocity? Is that even possible? And the answer is no. But um, I don't know. Like maybe if- unless it's being pissed out by an alien. Yeah, like it- I don't know how fast that thing's peeing <laughs> or whatever it's doing. <laughs> I also laughed really hard at OJ having a flip phone. I just think that's so like on brand for his character. Yeah. I love Keith David. It was so <laughs> exciting to see Keith David. Um, and it was a, a a crying shame when he was killed really fast. But yeah. Um, yeah, love Keith David. I recognized him, but I couldn't tell where. So just like everything in this movie, I didn't really get it until I went home and did like 14 hours of research. But once I realized who that was, I was like, oh, that is the coolest. He's one of those dudes that's just in everything. And I know that Jordan Peele has said before that he loves John Carpenter. and So he's in a couple of pretty iconic John Carpenter roles. So it's cool he got to use him for this. Yeah. Okay. Well, we see old-timey footage of a horse and jockey racing and then cut to OJ with a horse on a set. OJ seems uncomfortable, and he and the folks on set aren't really seeing eye to eye. OJ awkwardly starts the animal safety meeting when his sister Emerald runs into the room. She immediately takes over the safety meeting, and it's clear that she is just a natural performer. They start filming in a rush, and the horse, Lucky, ends up kicking something over. It looks like a light. I think it was a light. Okay. I could never tell every single time I've watched this. Um, And then, unfortunately, the Haywoods lose the job. Uh, Really uncomfortable scene. Yeah. And I know it's that's on purpose, and they did a really great job of casting the shittiest white people in the world, <laughs> especially the director. There's like a there's like a really quick little I I already forget exactly what he said. It was mostly like a noise that he made in response to something, um, that just made you feel how insincere he is, and like mm-hmm. the dialogue where he's just like, well, "I thought we were getting the dad or whatever." Yeah. It was. Like they it very uncomfortable scene, and you can tell that OJ is uncomfortable and. Um, and I, yeah, I, as awful as the scene is to watch, I, I love it because yeah. Jordan Peele does this stuff really, really, really well. Cause I'm sure he's probably had experiences like this in Hollywood. Absolutely. So when you see Daniel Kaluuya act, you know, he's, he's doing such a great job with this low key persona. Mm-hmm. And then you watch the Blu-ray extras and you hear him speak. <laughs> First of all, British as fuck. Jesus. I I mean, you know, uh, I mean, how bad is it when Americans try to do a British accent? I don't, I I have a hard time remembering an American who can pull that off in a movie effectively. Yeah. But everybody else can do an American accent Mm -hmm. so well. Mm -hmm. And I give him so much credit for that. It's so wild. Um, I think Jordan Peele also said that he specifically wrote the character of OJ with Daniel Kaluuya in mind. He's he has such so much expression, and this character has so much emotion, and things that he doesn't want to express like externally. So you really take in like his silence and his eyes and how he's communicating with his body, and you can feel that tension, that uncomfortableness. But he also cares deeply about the animals he's caring for. He's mourning the weird, bizarre sudden death of his father it's only six months later and he's now the man he's the one who's got to be giving the safety talk because his sister she's you know a breeze in the wind and she's Mm -hmm. supposed to be there to do this part but 
because he wants to protect the animal and he wants to get the people in the room who aren't listening to him to tell them. And so he's struggling with how am I going to keep this business afloat? This is my job and these people are not listening to me and and some and and shit does happen. Like there is there is an accident and the whole thing sets it up for later about like the, don't look the animals in the eye and you learn and he we flash back to this scene later too when he's remember, when he's realizing don't look the animal a being in the eye mm-hmm. make that connection. So just a really great scene. I like too that OJ tells the film people not to look the horse in the eye, but mm-hmm. also OJ OJ can't make eye contact with like any of these mm-hmm. people. Like he's doing the same thing. Um, yeah, I love that quote that you mentioned, Matt, where the guy's like, "Where's the other guy?" And the one guy's like, "Dude, he died about six months ago. A bunch of random shit fell out of the plane. So I guess we're stuck with Junior over here." <laughs> right. And the oh. other guy literally says, "Oh fuck!" Oh, right fuck. in front of OJ. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And then walks away. Hey, guy. <laughs> like, it's, oh, it just, it feels gross. It's, everybody has had some experience similar to that where someone has been disappointed to see them. And so that's, just, ugh. yeah. The other thing that cracked me up was after, um, uh, Emerald's speech, which is like amazing. One of the guys you hear him say, "Okay, that was great. That was a lot. That was a lot. <laughs> yeah. Was a oh, lot. Fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's our introduction to her and her character. I loved her character yeah. so much. Number one, she always has these bright, colorful clothes on, which is a great contrast. It matches her personality, and she's so vivacious and bubbly. And it's the complete opposite of her brother OJ. So I really enjoyed seeing her, her our introduction to her in this. Yeah. How much <laughs> energy and like just charisma. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, you and OJ? What? Okay. <laughs> I love that she just is Kiki Palmer. Uh-huh. Like there's basically no separation whatsoever between their two characters. Oh, she also says she does motorcycles, which I love because we see her on one later. <laughs> yeah, she's a brand. She's just selling her brand. <laughs> OJ and Emerald drive past inflatable men, which I read are called sky dancers. Mm-hmm. Is that yes. a thing? Yes. Yep. I've never heard that in real life before, but okay. You've never tried to buy one. <laughs> uh, the siblings stop at Jupiter's Claim, a local tourist attraction run by former child star Ricky Jupe Park. OJ drops Lucky off and reveals to Emerald that he's already sold 10 horses. They go inside to talk to Jupe, and Emerald recognizes him from TV and walks around the room admiring the memorabilia, while OJ tries to set up a pathway to buying back the horses. After she recognizes a framed copy of Mad Magazine with a Gordy's Home cover, Jupe shows her this weird-ass hidden room filled with Gordy's Home memorabilia. He launches into some... (laughs) sweet stats about the show (laughs) but when she asks what really happened he retells the snl skit that was based off Mm -hmm. the incident and then it cuts to a flashback of a young scared jupe hiding underneath the dining room table on set i just love the snl recap here (laughs) for a skit that never occurred Mm -hmm. you know it's so detailed and it was so much my era of snl (laughs) when you know chris Catan's gonna play the chip too you're like waiting for him to say chris Catan, then he says and you're like yeah exactly i'm that that really happened right oh no it didn't yeah well it's like that was that was very much the era of snl that i grew up watching so Mm -hmm. when they were listing off daryl hammond and cherry o'terry and Uh those people it's like you can picture that because i can picture chris Catan frantically eating one of those apples because he he, played that mango character exactly yeah (laughs) yeah man yeah that's so funny because I don't recognize a single name. On that yes. <laughs> just, just missed you. Probably. Yeah. 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 But this is also where um, the word spectacle, Jupe says, it was a spectacle. People are just obsessed. Mm-hmm. And that's why he has this weird room. People are just obsessed. And so he can make money off of it, of this trauma and this horrible thing that happened to him as a child. And spectacle becomes a big, yep. consistent theme all throughout. Um, yeah. And he yeah. that was when we... I think that was the first time we heard the word spectacle. Yeah. Besides the quote. Although this yeah, was when I quote. started to be like, damn, could we get like a synonym up in here? <laughs> like, I've already heard this. Yeah, the room is super fucked up, especially after you've seen the rest of the movie. Um, it's, yeah, super weird. I also find it weird that anyone would pay, I think he says 50K to spend the night. To spend the night. Like it's a haunted house or something. Yeah. Like, what is the appeal there? Right, because it's, 
it's not the actual set where the accident happened. It's just no. where all the shit exists now. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> pay me 50K to see the shoe. Do you want to sleep poster. next to the shoe that's in a case <laughs> that you can't open? That just that feels like a waste. But people are stupid. If people, well, yeah, people with money have, you know, have half a brain cell and want to spend that much money. That's like a, that's a sneeze to them. Yeah. yeah. They sneeze out of their wallet. Right. Um, I love that the kid sheriff poster is just the holes poster. Little uh, baby me was like, oh, this is a reference I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also kind of Indiana Jones-like. Like the bit. font looks kind of like that. Yeah. I also <laughs> love that Daniel Yun says, su casa es mi casa, and Emerald answers, thank you, I sure will. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I didn't catch until the very last time I watched it for this was um, he goes by Jupe, but unless I'm wrong, I think that's like what his character's name was on Kid Sheriff. I think his character's name was Jupiter. So that is also pretty fucked to be like in your middle aged years and still going by the nickname that you were given as a child actor. Yeah, he's, he's, hanging, show. he's hanging on to that. He's using it as part of keeping him his name out there well, and, to and make money and be famous. And it speaks to what happens to child actors a lot, mm -hmm. where they often will be defined by that, and then it usually causes them a lot of problems later in life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you think of one of the themes in the movie as being um, what happens to Hollywood, or what is Hollywood, Yeah, and that... Part of it is the spectacle of him and the why that room exists. And then he's got, you know, Jupiter's Jupiter claim. Is that what this is? Jupiter's part of claim. Jupiter's claim. Yeah. Which um, they rebuilt on the Universal Studios Hollywood Heard train that. tour. So you can visit it. Um, I guess it's like, um, like supposedly right after the Star Lasso experience happens. So it's all like empty and there's a bunch of stuff like mm, that's cool. Flying cool. around. Yeah. We cut back to OJ and M walking home outside where M asked how much Jupe offered in order to buy the ranch. They go inside and start to drink, listen to music, and hang out. Emerald recalls that when she was nine years old, she was supposed to get to train her own horse named Jean Jacket. Instead, their father booked the horse for a job on the movie Scorpion King. Their father never looked up at M standing in the window, but OJ did. They reminisce about their dad when M suddenly sees that a horse named Ghost is standing by itself outside in the arena. I like how the different segments of the movie have the different horses' names in it. Mm -hmm. I thought that was cool. Um, I love the sunset in the background. Like the entire sky when they're walking home is so beautiful. And although I never quite saw it, I guess you can see the cloud that Jean Jacket is hiding in in that background. So mm -hmm. it's like he's there, but you... You're not, like, attuned to look for him yet. Right. Right. There's also that scene on the porch um, about asking what's a bad miracle, mm -hmm. and that comes into play a lot in the film. I love that idea. I love the relationship between the brother and sister mm -hmm. here. Yep. It's, it's playful and teasing and kind of uh, understanding of their shared childhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That may or may not have been happy. We don't quite get a glimpse into how they grew up and whether they had a happy childhood or not. Yeah, you could kind of make some assumptions based on the fact that she hasn't been there in a while. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and if you think about, like, if you're working with animals, that takes a lot of time and energy, but also you're working in show business, and those animals, and you want to get those animals in production safely, blah, blah, blah. You want to get paid. So it sounds like it, I was imagining it being like an intense household, in like independent of like whatever personal relationships they had with each other. For but sure. I, but I really love that, Christopher, too, their relationship. And at first, too, because when we meet, see them together, there's some tension when they're at Jupe's claim and then when they are in the office. And then when they come back, they're just like messing around, you know. Oh, you got the hobby weed? Come on, let's get in the liquor, let's get, let's get in the liquor, liquor cabinet. Like they're like twelve years old, you know. Yeah. <laughs> These two are far and away the best parts of the movie mm -hmm. for me. Um, I, I I'm convinced that they're. I'm convinced they're related, um, <laughs> and they seem to have a real relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't 
feel quite as strongly about a lot of the other supporting actors, even though there's not a ton of people mm-hmm. in this movie. No. Yeah. Um, you can really sense their chemistry as actors, and the movie is so intense and foreboding and quiet, and there's this, like, the sense of something that's coming, but they add the the heart and the humor. They just add this lightness. And some of the the stuff that that Emerald says is just great because it's just it gives you that little bit of a okay, okay, there's you know, that brightness. Yeah. Or she's, that sense of she's humor. goofy. Yeah. It's 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 because he's yeah. he's really stoic and mm-hmm. um and just kind of effortlessly cool. Yeah. And she's goofy. And I but I love it. Mm-hmm. I love when she's asking him how much they got offered for um, Jeep to buy the farm, and he's like, "Why?" She's like, "I'm trying to see. I'm trying to see how much of a dumbass you are." I mean, that's <laughs> big dumbass, probably. <laughs> <laughs> that's some real like sibling shit. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And also when they're in the car, and she's like, uh, "Can I get the cool OJ? Because this whack ass so, yes. OJ." <laughs> that's the line I love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they have um, like what seems like a really fun relationship offset as like friends, and it made all of the um, like cast interviews that they did around this time super fun to watch. OJ goes out to the arena. Emerald turns on some loud music, which spooks Ghost, who runs further away from the house. OJ goes to look for Ghost in the dark. He can see Jupe's park off in the distance, where Jupe is clearly practicing for a show. The electricity powers down briefly, and OJ watches as a dust devil sucks up a horse into the sky right near Jupe's place. The lights come back up, and OJ sees a flying saucer fly by. He returns to the house to check the surveillance footage with M. They go out on the porch where OJ asks, what's a bad miracle? M asks what OJ saw, and he tells her about the UFO. This movie doesn't really have a lot of jump scares, but I love... This little mini jump scare when Emerald turns the music on super loud. Because, um, like Christopher said, we're kind of attuned to listening to the background and scanning the background to see if there's anything happening. And that's like a great little misdirect. Mm-hmm. And it's also great because it inadvertently puts OJ in more danger because Ghost runs and he's got to go find him. Right. I also like that it kind of sets up one of the themes, that, the big scene that happens at the end where M's in the house and OJ is out there with a horse. The completely different things are happening, but having watched it a couple of times and I'm like, oh yeah, that's a similar kind of thing where she's looking out the window, has the record playing. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't really think about how they're kind of um, like bookends almost to this little thing here. Um, I also like that you can hear Jupe practicing from far away, mm-hmm. and this is our first actual uh, shot of Jean Jacket, where OJ sees it too. Yeah, because we don't know what Jupe is doing. It's it's hard to talk about this movie after you've seen it a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Like I wish, and I guess I, because when I saw it in the movie theater, of course I went home that night and I was like looking up a bunch of articles, like processing it, and I wish that that there. I didn't have that that nowadays built-in inclination to you know process and digest and absorb and learn and read everything about it instead of just like sitting slow with it and just like not knowing what's going on. Yeah, I was unsatisfied at first because Same. I really didn't un- I, I didn't understand what I just saw, which is a great pull because then I had to do my Allison thing and do mm-hmm. like a bazillion hours of mm-hmm. research, but. Um, yeah, at first I, I really didn't know what I was seeing for the most part. Mm-hmm. And like the word spectacle so many times I'm like, oh, okay, that's like obviously, you know, part of the stew here. But I don't know what half the ingredients are yeah. or what this is supposed to be at the end. It's but, it's an interesting because this was obviously like a big tentpole summer movie. Mm-hmm. And when I the first time I saw it, I didn't really like it. And it was because I missed a lot of the stuff. And I it's it's an interesting choice to put out a big movie like this in the summer and hope that your audience is going to catch all of that stuff mm-hmm. and want to come back and watch it again because I didn't watch it again until yesterday for really? this. Um, yeah, and I actually like I ranked it like significantly lower than than us and Get Out, um, but only because to me it it uh, 
and I don't feel this way anymore, but it felt like a movie that I had to do homework after uh, to be like, oh, okay, well, now I got to go find all the shit that they that they buried in this movie. I like that. <laughs> I, I can like that. But you also have to keep in mind that your audience, me, is sometimes dumb and is not always looking for stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But again, I probably, the first time I watched it, I fell asleep. So I clearly was not the best audience mm-hmm. to begin well, with. Plus you're watching it at home too. <laughs> yeah. Like in the movie theater, like I saw it with um, one of my youngest nieces and it was, we were both mesmerized because we didn't know what was going on. It was so beautiful, so big. It was, it was really, it was a really, really cool experience because afterwards her and I was just like, whoa, that that was great. That was amazing. And, you know, and she was younger to see like, you know, a quote unquote horror movie. And I was like, that wasn't scary. Right. And she's like, no. So right. we were just having that conversation with her, but we were both just kind of like, what, what? And I immediately liked it, but again, didn't know all the things, but I knew there were things I missed because it's a Jordan Peele movie. Right. I want to know the larger picture of everything that that it encompassed. And I know that now I know to Mm -hmm. like, like there's going to be a lot of stuff to look for in his movies. And the other, the other thing, and this just speaks to my own hearing loss, um, (laughs) but watching it this time with subtitles, I was able to pick up on way more of what was going on because the first time I saw it and again it might have just had something to do with when I was watching it or if because I was watching at home if I if I paused it at any point to get up and do something that probably broke some tension but there was a lot of dialogue that I just didn't understand what they said and just kind of moved on Mm -hmm. with but that's that's also a symptom of modern sound design in movies I think where a lot of the a lot of the like ambient stuff will be way louder than the dialogue and maybe yes. it's on purpose but sometimes it means that i will miss a very important part of dialogue mm-hmm. yeah you know. and there's so much important dialogue as allison was saying earlier there's a lot of things that come into play every line yeah. seems to have something buried in it that refers to something else that happens earlier or is coming later which yeah. is very cool mm-hmm. yeah i got to see it in imax which was really great um particularly Particularly because, like, the screen was so large, and I was one of two people in the theater because I also was not feeling that comfortable in uh, COVID times. So I went at, like, I think 10 o'clock in the morning. Just out of curiosity, which theater did you see it in? Uh, Yeah, that was the other problem, honestly, was I went to the um, Cinemark. Is that what it's called now? Yeah, um, which was great. Very close to my house. It was easy. But um, there was something kind of fucked up with their IMAX theater in that... um, The screen had all of these, like, lines across it, which was really, really obvious during the um, night uh, shots. It was very distracting. And that wasn't true when I saw it in just a regular theater a couple weeks or maybe a month later. Hmm. Um, But also the sound design is, like, so specific in this movie, and that really added to it, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mostly when Jean Jacket is like over top of uh, OJ or when he's when he like comes down and like is on the side towards the end. It was so overpowering. It was like the bass is like rattling my heart. I'm like, oh, my God, am I about to die in here? (laughs) But um, it like really added to the effect of this being some like huge, unknowable, like super powerful being. Yeah. Yeah. Just the size of it. Of seeing Jean Jacket on the screen, the big screen was huge. Yeah. But I mean, honestly, with Jordan Peele's movies are something like I, I was hesitant or just out of the habit of seeing movies as regularly as I used to before, you know, spring of 2020. And when Nope was coming out, I knew that was one I wanted to see in a theater, but it was just finding the time and the place. And then this opportunity arose to go see it at the theater uh, while I dished my family. But <laughs> he's one. Of, he's a director where I do want to see his movies on the big screen because of just the the spectacle of when one of his movies comes out, you know? Yeah. Sure. He also said in some interview that he kind of designed this movie to be seen in a uh, theater setting. Oh, really? Because hmm. he wrote it during, like, that first year of COVID where he wasn't sure, like, what the future of cinema was going to be. So he <laughs> sort of, um, you know, made this movie to draw people back into the theater and, like, uh, add value to that experience. It worked. Yeah, it, did, say, yeah. it did pretty well in theaters, especially considering that everything else didn't do very well that year. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think July was a great time for it to come out because you think of him as being a horror director and there's going to be something spooky about it. And it had a suspenseful element, but it wasn't like 
as horror as some of the other things. Mm-hmm. So it, to me, it made sense because if it would have come out like in October and somebody saw that, they, they would have been like, man, that what? That wasn't a horror what? Mm-hmm. I remember uh, when this came out, like talking to people who had seen it and they they said that it was more science fiction, but that it, mm-hmm. that it felt like an Amblin movie, like a like Jaws yeah. or something like mm-hmm. that. Where yeah. it, and in that sense, hearing that probably colored my perspective because I definitely was very aware of it the entire time. It's like you get you get so many of the beats of of literally Jaws in yeah. this, mm-hmm. Betw- like between just people that are introduced, like experts and the camera guy who we haven't, who we haven't seen him yet. Well, we did see him earlier, but yeah, just for a second. Though. But he barely says anything. Yeah. The guy from the fuck is he from? Alien Resurrection. Mm-hmm. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, he's. He, he dies pretty fast in that. Good old antlers. What a dumb name. <laughs> Sorry, Jordan Peele, but that's a dumb name. <laughs> Try again, dude. <laughs> what is that referencing? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, don't make me it, Google that. It's some, ref, uh, it's some reference to some other god or something, and there's some relation to horns. So he shows antlers. And then Holst is based on some other movie maker or something. But I don't care. <laughs> I did like the sort of Spielberg feel of this movie, which I feel like is missing in a lot of modern movies. Agreed, um, including even Spielberg movies. <laughs> yes. Oh, God, don't even get me started. Um, and I also liked that it wasn't that scary because then I could take my husband to see it a second time. <laughs> That's right. I <laughs> forgot that he's not a fan of the horror stuff. No. That's Which is funny. so funny to be like, yeah, come see this movie where this chimpanzee totally like murders, you know, a bunch of people. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Well that, well, that was how my 13-year-old niece got to go with me to see. I'm like, I can't, I'm not looking it up to know if it's, I'm like, it might be a horror movie. I don't know. It's Westerns. I don't know what it's about. Aliens. I can't Google anything. Yeah. Like, you, mom, look it up, see if she's allowed to go see it. And I was like, blah, 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 like on the way there. Yeah. And then they're like, okay, she can go and see it. And I was like, cool. On all the marketing <laughs> for this, I remember like when they, because they aired the trailer during the Super Bowl. Uh-huh. And it was like, no idea what the fuck this movie called Nope is going to mm-hmm. be about. Yeah. And then the next thing, I, do, I very distinctly remember that there was like a web campaign where they had a website that you could go to that was the Jupiter's Claim website. Yeah. And there were all these weird little games on it that I went through and tried every single one of them just to see, like, what the fuck is this, what the fuck is this movie going to be about? Not clear. Did it have the camera well? The wink it and did. well? It there the was wink something well? like that with the wink and well, and then there was something, like, and there were all these sound effects that later, now that I'm thinking about them, were probably, like, lifted from Jean Jacket. And it was just, it, it like, it, Played kind of like if you were if you were going to like Knott's Berry Farms website or <laughs> Cedar Point's website. It's so funny you say yeah. that because I'm on it right now and it looks um, it looks like they use the exact same um, outline that the Universal Studios. Yeah, I'm sure uh, they did. It looks yeah. really cool. Yeah. So I have not looked at it, but Allison pulled it up on her computer. So the actual Jupiter's claim it reminded me of that that area of Cedar Point. Uh-huh. What is, is it Cedar is it Frontier or Town? Yeah. Frontier, Frontier Land. Town, Frontier Land, it? whatever that's called. It has like the little saloon because it just has these little shacks. So that's what it oh, reminds me of. I'm thinking of Disney. I don't World. know if that's still, yeah. I haven't been to Cedar Point in years. Does that still exist? There's there? Frontier Town at Cedar Point. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah. <laughs> it has come to old time saloon. Disney. Um, Oh, it received a makeover to coincide with the opening of Steel Vengeance in 2018. I haven't been to Cedar Point in a very long time. Same. It's very funny that all of the photos on this website are in the winter when Cedar Point is closed. <laughs> that's, that's dumb. I think we, you know, a la Brady Bunch, I think we need a Cedar Point on location. What Ooh. scares us episode? Wow. <laughs> I would love that. Hawaii right? so, is out of the question. So what would we watch I in thought that we were case? going to space. <laughs> We are going to space. <laughs> so we'd have to watch like a theme park theme. Yeah, 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 I think yeah, so yeah. Final Destination 3 then. Yeah, Ooh. Yeah. I love that Oh one. my God. <laughs> I could get all about this. Horror road trip movie. Ooh. We can We can watch The Hitcher. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the thing that I always thought was Stephen King. But, <laughs> but I don't think it is. Anyway. I've I've gotten us horribly off track. Here. <laughs> there's um that Stephen King book. There's Joyland. Ooh. Oh, which I have and haven't read and yet. And then but there's I hear it's what great. is the other one called? The Hitchhiker one. The Hitchhiker one. Riding the bullet. <laughs> yes, riding the bullet. Hmm. Well, roller coasters. Speaking of roller coasters, riding the bullet. Ah. Uh, yeah, that's a nice little two-hour audio mat. 
I just watched um, George Romero has some extremely weird movie called The Amusement Park. Hmm. And it's actually about like aging. But um, I think he must have rented out like some little tiny amusement park. It was interesting. It wasn't that great, but um, I feel like that was on it my was list. some weird shit. <laughs> I feel like that was on a, a to be watched movie, but I wasn't able to find it to to watch it. It's free on Shutter. But okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm a fool. We would do Tourist Trap. That's what if we were doing a road trap thing. Have you ever seen? Has anybody here seen Tourist Trap? No. Oh, it's 80s schlocky. It's great. Oh. Maybe late 70s. Anyway. They head to Fry's Electronics for a better security system. M suggests that they try to get photographic evidence of UFOs for a big payday. Specifically, they want the Oprah shot. (laughs) They check out and meet Angel, who persuades them to spring for installation of the camera system. Angel arrives for install and screams and tells them about his recent breakup. M leaves while Angel installs the system and returns with a fake horse decoy clearly stolen from Jupiter's claim. Jupe pulls up at a distance to invite them to his new family live show on Friday. Angel finishes the install and leaves. I love the scene where Jupe shows up to ask where they yes. got that horse. It's so awkward and goofy <laughs> and funny, and they're yelling at each other across this long, long field. Yeah, yeah, and then because they're he's about to ask where'd you get that, and then Emerald asks before he could ask yeah. where'd you get yours, and then Angel gets so involved. And like they're like, you don't live here. Shut yeah. up. Yeah, right. He's like, I just got so caught up in the moment. Funny. I was trying to help, and we literally just met this guy. I and I think I feel like Angel is another element, and I was not annoyed by him whatsoever. I thought he was kind of endearing and a good little fit for their little misfit, you know, tribe of alien hunters. And then he's got all this tech experience. <laughs> it was all right. I it was it, it was interesting to read and some of the trivia stuff that they had to fundamentally rewrite it for the actor because they originally wrote it to be like kind of a dweeb. Yeah, which he, I mean, he was still kind of. He was kind of cool, but he was still like, he wanted to like sit at home on his couch and, you know. Do VR. Yeah, do VR and play video games and smoke yeah. weed. Like he, you know, was he more like a slacker instead of a dweeb? Yeah. he. Not that we need to put everybody into, a, right. a, give everybody a category. Right. He was just angel. Yeah. He was an angel. Sent from heaven. <laughs> sent from the sky above. Oh, so in the extras on the Blu-ray, we see that OJ has a thing for Oprah. Oh. Do you remember that? No. Hmm. Where, I think it's in the the outtakes, where M is teasing him about wanting to watch all the Oprah movies, and he's got an <laughs> Oprah thing, and it goes on and on. Huh. It's funny. There's another part There's another part in this movie that where Oprah is mentioned in conversation, yeah. not the, the Oprah shot. I forget what it was. Yeah. <sighs> Well, they're always trying to get on Oprah, and I think, isn't Oprah on, Oprah is on TV in one scene. Where, oh, she is? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they mention her in conversation outside of the money shot part. Isn't th- she on TV? I think it must be a reference to that um, Sharla Nash video that happened in real life. Like when that woman was yeah. actually attacked by a chimpanzee in right. 2009. Yeah. She went on Oprah afterward and she wears the same veiled hat. Yep. Well, I mean, the Oprah show, especially the one that was on network television, all that was was spectacle for mm-hmm. the most part. So <laughs> hey, come look at her. Everybody look at her face. Everybody. Yep. here, Here's the veil off. Look how scary this is. And it fucking worked on me. Yeah. <laughs> so wait a minute. You're saying that woman in the stands. Yes. Based on a real life. Based person. on a okay. real thing. So yeah. I knew about that real life chimp attack. Yeah. But I, the whole time I've been wondering what the relation is or what the point is of that woman in the stands. And mm. and Jupe says my first crush. Yeah. yeah. She was in the Who show was with on him. the show. Yeah. She yeah. survived. And none of the first time I saw that, none of that was clear. And she even showed up in the first trailer, trailer. Yeah. which is kind of like oh what is this sca-? like i assumed um because i was trying to make sense of everything when they first showed that trailer that oh she must be an alien mm. but you know <laughs> interesting nope, <laughs> nope. <laughs> she's just a really unlucky lady <laughs> well it yeah. makes sense to also like you have to wonder like why is she there and i just thought that that jupe would have invited her to be part of the spectacle because he's still living off of that trauma who knows how her perception of it like she's not hiding she's wearing right. things but she's still out in public and 
people know her as the person who was in that. Right. Yeah. Mm. But you know, as like a person who's watching it for the first time, like I don't think I I didn't know who that was. No. Yeah. Just kind of a frightening thing to see. Yeah. Well, there's so much other weird stuff going on in the movie. You're like, oh, that's just yeah. another right thing in the audience. She's just not drinking one of those blue ices they're selling. Right. And you can kind of see her face, and then mm-hmm. eventually when she looks up, you it can. Blow, yeah, the veil yeah. blows. Damn, she really shouldn't have looked up. <laughs> yeah, she fared better than the real person. <laughs> yeah, I guess that lady got a face transplant. Yes. I remember all the um, articles and stuff about that when that happened. Yeah. Don't buy chimpanzees, people. No. Yeah. Please. <laughs> Unrelated. <laughs> but... I love when Angel's like, she's an actress model, you know? She booked a pilot on the CW. So, yeah, she fucking left me. Fucking CW. Like, <laughs> what an intro to this man. He just shows up and he's like, ah! Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Working at a Fry's, which I guess that was a real Fry's before that chain closed and it had all of the, like, the, the UFO stuff. All that was real. Yeah. Like, just to... Just kind of like the, um, there's like that weird UFO McDonald's, yeah. like they're like I love kitschy like stuff that. like that. Me too, <laughs> me too. Um, I guess all the fries were different. So this was the Burbank location, right. and then one of them I didn't really look into it that much, but one of them had like a um, ancient Egypt theme. It looked like you were going into a big pyramid. That's cool. Yeah, to buy consumer electronics <laughs> <laughs> from Ra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That night, OJ hears something in the stables. He goes to investigate and finds three alien figures. He punches one who gets too close to him. Turns out it's the kids from Jupiter's Claim who tell OJ not to mess with them anymore. Angel's working late at Fry's when he notices that camera B is off. OJ tries to bring Clover in when he witnesses another dust devil sucking the fake horse into the sky. M realizes it's in the cloud and yells for OJ to run. She... I love this so much. She throws Sour Patch Kids at the camera to Uh try and scare a praying mantis off the camera lens. Meanwhile, OJ hides while the creature takes Clover. M tries to convince OJ to pack up and leave, but he refuses. OJ has a dream of his dad saying that some animals aren't fit to be trained. Emerald calls Antlers to ask if he'll record the creature and get the impossible shot, but he refuses. Angel shows up to point out that there's a cloud that never moves in the recordings, and OJ asks, what if it's not a ship? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. OJ is so smart, and he's so in tune to animals and their behavior. And having that dream of animals can't be tamed. The whole thing just really so good. Oh, yeah. So the first time I saw this movie and OJ's in the stables with those aliens, I was freaked out. Mm -hmm. I was, too. I thought it was so effective. I was scared. I was really unnerved. And <laughs> it's a good tense scene. It is. <laughs> and then it's also funny at the end. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's it's a it's a good scene. Yeah, and it's so slow and normally I hate I hate it when the viewer can't see exactly what's going on, but I think it's really effective here and yeah. the sound effects. Yeah. You know that that <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that weird metallic whirring. Yep, mm-hmm. and then another one comes out. Yeah, I I thought the scene's great. There's one scene in particular where he's like looking at some wooden thing, and the alien's head so slowly comes like around, around the from corner behind, behind him. Oh, I, think I hate he's it. Filming it on yeah. his camera, on his phone. right? Oh. On his phone. <laughs> and then we see it. Yeah, yeah. Which is so interesting that that's his instinct is to try and get it on camera. Mm-hmm. Ends up with the whole movie. Spectacle. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, literally, I mean, that's, yeah. it's just another element. Even all the other cameras that are in the movie. and I also love the first time we see those little aliens in the stables. It's clearly on some sort of handheld camera, and it's moving, and it just, like, really puts the viewer in, like, OJ's view. Like, you really feel like you're in his shoes because that's exactly what he sees. And I love that he says no peer. It's like the yeah. one that works for me. Yes, I I agree. I, yep. I'm glad you said that because a couple of other times when it happens, I was like, no, you got you got to stop. It doesn't happen it. a lot, yeah. but that one was good because it was funny. Yeah. 
We do hear nope a lot in the movie. Yes. Yes. But like in the first scene. Yes. When uh, the the TV show. Nope. Nope. Right. Yeah. And Angel says it in her little, yeah. Yeah. Again, same with spectacle. Like, I feel like we could have done a little less with it because at a certain point, I felt like they were just hammering you over the head with it. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't remember the word noping in there as much as you guys do. Oh, man. It was oh, really it's... distracting to me after a while. Yeah. yeah. There were a couple of poignant ones in that one. There's also one when Emerald says it, which was a good one. Oh, I do like when uh, later when he opens the car door. That one worked for me as well. Yeah, yes. I think I actually wrote that one in my notes. Mm -hmm. Yep. I love that Emerald comes in. She's like, oh, they want to fuck with us? It's on. And then OJ's like, yeah, but you like stole their horse. She's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't quite see the dark scenes on my TV. It's like the settings of my TV. So I actually don't even know if Clover gets sucked up here because I, so, I just heard what I thought was a horse screaming, which yes. may even do that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny you say this because I actually I had to change the device I was watching this on because um, my the dynamic contrast settings on my TV made it so dark at one point that I couldn't see something that I remembered seeing the first time. Oh. Um, so while it's it's a really cool and really innovative way that they shot these dark scenes, it's too fucking dark. Yes. And like that speaks more to the way that my television was calibrated, or in this case, the one in our living room was calibrated, which that's set up to watch like reality TV and other bullshit like that. <laughs> um, oh, like Survivor? <laughs> Yeah, or or <laughs> Naked and Afraid, or 90 Day Fiance, or... Is that a setting on your TV? Bullshit the Naked and Afraid setting? The bullshit setting? setting? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> there is a profile on there that is that it's like, hold on, we're not watching Succession tonight. We're watching something shitty. So it's just bright. Um, but, yeah, th there are there are a few, and it, and it doesn't feel like it was the intention of yeah. the cinematographer for it to be so dark that your TV actually goes to all black. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't know if the, I don't know if you guys experienced that too at all. No, mine was there was... a point where you couldn't see anything? No. Okay. I remember no. having a problem with uh. darkness at all. And I watched it, well, yeah. I watched it at night. Our TV's old enough that it still works. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> it was never a problem in the theaters, but yeah, both times I watched it at home, I was like, well, I didn't have a problem with the darkness. I also don't remember this part with if Clover got sucked up or not. I don't remember that. It's not super important. I just feel like I should have been able to tell if that happened. <laughs> <laughs> you should be able to see the things that happen in movies. You don't need to see what happens in the movie. Especially if it's artsy. There's so much of this film where <clears throat> every, it's off camera. Like the unknown is the scare. Like, yeah. Like Jaws. Mm-hmm. Um, this is also the part where um, Christopher mentioned earlier that OJ still has the coin that killed his dad in a in the bag that he took it home from on his wall. Mm -hmm. I didn't catch that till the last time. <clears throat> Oof, right to the heart. Yeah, I don't really. Right through the eye. Sorry. Yeah, I don't. I've obviously, never been in this situation, but I don't know that I would keep it like that. It's hard to know how everybody processes grief differently. I guess, but. Apparently, I was reading in the trivia that apparently, like, when they show that scene, you can see the year on it, and that's when Jordan Peele was born. I don't know if that's... Oh, really? I don't know how much that matters, but... Huh. Um, towards the end, they also ask Antlers if he'll help, and um, he says... Uh, no, Kiki says, we're looking for the impossible shot. And he says, that's impossible. This is when the dialogue was not quite like sitting right with me. And all of these little things, I was like, oh, come on, I get it. It works for me a lot better on rewatches. But that first time I was like not quite jiving with this. I completely agree. The first time I saw it, I thought some of the dialogue was just stupid <laughs> because I didn't realize that it was all very heavily calculated and meant to be in reference to something. And the, I think that's the only real criticism I have of this movie is, again, if you watch it once and you don't like it and you don't feel like coming back to it, you'll miss a lot of great stuff. Yeah. And that 
is, I don't know. I guess great movies are meant to be rewatched, but agree. Man, I I like I had not felt inclined to rewatch this movie after watching it the first time. Mm-hmm. I've got what I thought I needed mm-hmm. from it, which was like a pretty good alien movie. When did it come out? Twenty twenty one. July twenty two. Is that right? Last July. Last July. Yeah. Wow. Time. Oh my goodness. So, okay. So I guess I've seen it three times in the past nine months or something. I don't think that's recommended. Like I saw it in the movie theater <laughs> and I, and I did want to see it again because I liked, I wanted to see it again and see things I missed, but I think I've only seen get out two or three times and I, I've only seen us twice. I've seen us twice. I've seen get out once because they're not, even though they're amazing and wonderful films, they're not, it's not like, Hey, let's throw in blah, blah, blah. You know, some, and it's and there are some like more cerebral movies where you have to think more or absorb more of or just be lost in the visuals of it. It does. I don't think it detra- it doesn't detract for the movie. And this is part of why I was saying that I wasn't in the mood to watch it. Yeah. Right. Even though I love it and was excited to talk about it, I'm just like, oh, I don't really, I don't want to want to watch it right now. <laughs> like, there's something heavy and cynical about all of his movies. And yeah. I think and I like that in a filmmaker but man it can be it can be a tall order to sit down and watch something that you know is going to make you feel a little bit bad yeah you know um that's a really good point i yeah. never would have thought of that yeah that said please keep making movies jordan peele because you're definitely <laughs> listening to this yeah and see it in the movie theater um we we're we're definitely big fans yeah i because he's listening right now <laughs> yes yeah yeah our friend jordan <laughs> So I really liked this movie overall, uh, and I loved seeing it in the theater. I loved seeing it that first time. Now that I've seen it a second time, I think I was a little, everything was a little bit dulled for me, and I was a little bit bored. I yeah. hate to say that, but I think of all the movies we've watched for the podcast, this one didn't quite hold my attention on a second viewing I think because there were still a lot of cool things that I saw the second time around that I missed the first time, but the overall arc of the plot and the reveal mm-hmm. had already yeah. been you know, revealed to me. Mm-hmm. I knew everything coming, and so I was missing that part of it on a second watch. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so maybe some movies, you know, for that reason, don't hold up on a second viewing. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, I wouldn't use, and I don't know what I term I, but yeah, I wouldn't it say holds it, up. I wouldn't say it doesn't word. hold yeah, up, yeah. but there's something that's different or, but it's, it's like you just said, like you've seen it the first time and that's part of it is the experience of not knowing it and then seeing what's going on and finding out Jean Jacket and who it is and what it is when you want, when you already know that, but there's other movies where you meet or figure out the mysterious thing that's happening that. It's just different with this movie. It's I don't know how to I really don't know how to explain it. Yeah. But it is part of it. You see it the first time and it's an it's an experience. And after you've done it once, you can do it again and enjoy it and think it's great. But it just hits differently than that, you know. Yeah. It reminds me of what Matt said at the end of A Tale of Two Sisters, where um like they're totally different viewing experiences because the first watch you're so focused on the mystery of it. Who's who? What's what? What's going on? Why does this feel weird? Like, you're trying to solve the mystery of what is happening. On a second watch, that is already solved for you. So that emotional component Mm -hmm. of the journey is over. So then I feel like on a second watch or a third watch or whatever, it's much more about, like, thematically what are they saying or Mm -hmm. noticing small things that you didn't before. But um, I think it's, for me, it's hard to sort of remember the emotional roller coaster of this movie the first time because I mean all of us have watched it many many times in the past not even year and so every viewing I feel like takes me just one little step away from that first watch where Mm -hmm. I was like what the fuck is Mm -hmm. going on plus having already watched it once done all the research and then watched it again for that second time I had sort of the same feeling this time where I was like I already sort of did that Not that long ago. So, like, what else is there to pull out? And I think it's sort of diminishing returns Mm -hmm. in such a short period of time with every rewatch. Unfortunately. You know, because there are are a bunch of movies that I can think of in a similar vein 
like the sixth sense Mm -hmm. or the prestige where it has some huge turn that happens in it that's really cool and it really fucks you up the first time you see it (laughs) and then and but everything else around it is in service to it i found myself this time just trying to figure out where jean jacket was in the sky because i'm like well i already (laughs) know that that thing is it's not a ship sorry to anybody that just found that out by listening (laughs) to this it's not a ship that said and i know we haven't gotten to this yet but but I was able to appreciate the sounds in the sky so much more. Mm-hmm. When you know what is going on, it mm-hmm. makes that stuff way scarier yeah. and way cooler. Um, yeah. And having that knowledge, like in the first scene when um, the when Keith da- David dies, mm-hmm. you can hear the hikers screaming, but you would never, ever, ever think that yeah. that's what you were hearing. Right. Yeah. Well, even when OJ when he's hearing um, Jupe do his performance from far away, I have no idea what that you, I, you don't know what he's saying exactly, what he's doing with what he's trying to tell the people that are, what you think would be in the audience around him. You don't, so the first time I thought, I didn't really think about that part. Yeah. But I will say though, in the movie theater, I was mesmerized the one hundred percent the entire time I was just staring at it. it was so cinematically beautiful and gorgeous and the lighting and the sound and everything was it was an experience. It's absolutely, absolutely. It was one of those movies where the movie ends and you're just like, whoa. You want to sit still and just stare at it and you don't know what to do. You don't mm-hmm. know what to do. Yeah. And that's, that's what totally I love agree. about this movie. And so when I think about this movie, um, it sounds like we have negative things to say, but it's not really. It's just a different way of talking about it or thinking about it when you've seen it so many times. Exactly. You know, but it's absolutely gorgeous, amazing. And I'm going to give it a, a higher ranking than a bunch of other stuff that we've watched for this show so far. I think this is the eighth one we've done mm-hmm. comparatively. Ninth. But ninth, yeah. This is ninth. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. You're Rebecca Dawson. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I feel like the last couple of things I've said have been, have sounded negative, but really like everything on paper about this movie, I really enjoy. It is a visual feast. All right. Let's watch a gym smash some shit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, we watch the beginning of a birthday scene being filmed for Gordy's home. Balloons popping on set send the animal actor playing Gordy into a violent, bloody rampage. Young Jupe watches from underneath a dining room table on set as the chimpanzee attacks and kills other members of the cast. He sees a shoe standing straight up at an impossible angle as the chimp walks back towards him. The chimpanzee looks at Jupe and walks directly up to him, although the tablecloth fails his eyes. Gordy uses American Sign Language to sign what happened to family and tries to fist bump Jupe, but the police come and shoot the chimpanzee, killing him. We cut to an adult Jupe getting ready for his family live show. It's an amazing scene. Yep. It's an amazing, it's brutal. It makes you stop breathing. And when I watched this the first time, I was like, I didn't understand how this, I'm like, why is that in the middle of this movie? Same. It makes sense. But I'm also like watching, I'm like, what is this? And even afterwards, like just talking about it, I was like, what's up with the, what's up with the, the, the monkey scene, the monkey scene, the monkey scene. Yeah. And what does that have what, to do that with was the buzz thing. Yes. Yeah. But it's so good. Yep. Imagine this movie without all the Gordy stuff. And I think you'd have a much paler, um, did, you know, uh, uh, sorry. You wouldn't have Jesus. to think very much. <laughs> yeah. You know, but you also wouldn't have the horrific next scene. Yeah. <laughs> right. Both of so. these back to back are like, uh, yeah. yeah, that was, that was a lot. This time yeah. the audience got it. <laughs> yeah. And two, like the fact that this young jupe as a kid, that's a severely, that's a huge, and he, here he is, it's a huge traumatic terrible event to have happened when you're a kid who's on a tv show and then you like flash forward and he is remembering it and talking up like in theory quote unquote he references snl he doesn't say it exactly so he's still holding some of it back but he's still trying to you know that spectacle again to say the s word it yeah He's trying to repackage it into something fun or funny whenever yeah. he talks to somebody about it. But clearly he's sitting there thinking about it because not only did he watch those people get mauled and beat, then he watched his 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 friend get shot in the head yeah. by the cops. And, While they're trying to do their little cute fist bump move they do. Yeah. It's also interesting, too, the connection of the, the two of the chimp and then this young boy. Like he didn't he didn't kill him. Yeah. 
only thing that takes me out of this scene a little bit is the motion capture doesn't look that good. It's just like the chimpanzee's face is just, it's like this uncanny, like, that's not real. Which I realize you couldn't get a chimpanzee actor to do that. Yeah. It's just and like, shouldn't. And shouldn't, exactly. Because <laughs> most of the movements worked, but then there were some parts of it, especially when he's approaching, where I was like, this would be really scary if it looked better. <laughs> but that's just me. One thing I did think about with that is when you see him more close up, when he's facing the boy, he's behind that little bit of a curtain. And I thought that was a really great choice because yeah. then you you know that there's the outline of him, but you didn't have to have that, that viewer experience of like judging what the effects were looking like. For sure. And I can't help myself. I just, I, I'm looking for that to, but like, man, prosthetics have come really far. You could have done a, <laughs> could have done a prosthetic. I don't know. But I bet that would have been expensive and time-consuming. And they, they had to spend all their money making getting that super glue for the shoe to stand erect in the middle of the floor. <laughs> <laughs> First time I saw that, I I was waiting for that to be something important and have some sort of special meaning oh, yeah. and all oh, yeah. of that. You were and... waiting for the shoe to drop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had the same experience though, like watching it for the first time because you're just like staring, like, oh my god, the shoe. What does it mean? Yeah. But then the shoe, you also saw. That's what's in his display case in his. The shoe is the alien. The shoe yeah. is the alien. It's Jean Jacket's original form. Yeah. yeah it's a jean <laughs> shoe. A shoe. <laughs> yeah. We're making an 80s outfit. No. Um, this was one of the places I remember where seeing it in IMAX was so great because um, for whatever reason, you can really see um, there are a bunch of people hiding behind the chairs in yep. the audience portion of the set. And you can see them moving around. It didn't pop up to me when I watched it again in theaters, um, uh, not in IMAX, but in IMAX, it was like all I could see was like all mm. of this really subtle movement in the background where you can like see yeah. people changing positions or trying to hide behind the seats. They're like a reflection of what people in the in the actual audience are probably doing in, in some part. Because, man, if you were in there, you'd be doing the same fucking thing. Like oh, a chimpanzee's yeah. out. Nobody can stop it. Yeah. I totally missed that. Oh yeah, it's so, so small. in the in the like studio audience, you can see all these people that are like cowering, and like every once in a while they'll move and run. Wow, it's like one it's of those there. little details that's like chef's yeah. kiss. Again, right. this should be only seen in theaters, which is almost a strike against it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because if you're watching it midday on shitty setting on your TV, like me, <laughs> you know, you oh, might man. miss that stuff. <laughs> but. <laughs> Um, I guess this um, like scene was the very first one they shot, which is interesting. This had me thinking about all the different times that I've seen monkeys or chimpanzees or animals on TV. And it was funny because even just in the last month, um, Jordan and I are rewatching that 70s show hmm. because we're hilarious. Um, but there are two different episodes where um, I think they have an orangutan in one, but they have one... Uh, they have a chimpanzee in one episode and an orangutan in the other. I remember there being a chimpanzee on Full House. There's like some entire episode devoted to like Michelle brought home a monkey or something. I feel like in the 80s, yeah. like it was really big to have monkeys pop up in things. What? A couple of Clint Eastwood movies. Yeah, that's what the, I was yeah. Anyway, Anywhere but loose. And... damn orangutan. <laughs> chimpanzee shitting all over. <laughs> What? That's amazing. There's two of them. Any which way you can and any which way but loose. Yeah. Yeah. That's a... With Ruth Gordon. Yeah. It's a <laughs> tricky, tricky point in his career. Even though, like sitcoms and stuff, they were, especially if there was a family that had money. I don't know why. That's... Yeah. It's weird. Everybody loves seeing a monkey. Yeah. <laughs> spectacle. Um, oh. Sorry. <laughs> the ultimate spectacle. <laughs> yeah. A monkey. <laughs> a monkey. Don't kill everybody. <laughs> Um, IMDb like says that there was some uh, skit on SNL called I Married a Monkey. It's a recurring bit in the 80s. And the whole like crux of it was that the monkey would like fly into a rage at certain points. Um, you can find some clips on YouTube, which is interesting. And I could not um, find any real source mentioning this. But um, Mr. Peepers? Uh, no, I married a monkey. 
Um, and I guess in one of the dress rehearsals, the chimpanzee like actually tried to hurt someone and uh, they removed its teeth as a result. Oh Again, my God. I could not that find solves it. a real source for this, but. Oh. Oh. Wait, it was a real monkey. Yeah. Oh. In a recurring bit on SNL. Yeah. But interestingly enough, while I was looking for sources to confirm this story that is randomly on IMDb, I did run across a um, clip of Jason Bateman on SNL and yeah. uh, one of his more recent uh, performances on it, he talks about how he felt like he was almost injured by a chimpanzee the previous time that he was on SNL. So anyway, it just had me thinking about how often we've seen this on TV and film and how you don't even think about it. But yeah, these are wild animals every single instance. This also had me thinking about um, like this is I think the second most horrific scene in the movie to me. And I was really affected by it, especially in the movie theater. And um, one of the things I kind of reflected on afterward was um, even though the situation is different, a lot of the film language that they use is like how I imagine like a school shooting would be or some sort of mass shooting. Like you hear a loud noise, you know that something's happening, you can't see what's going on, you're listening for some big noise or for some like key in the background to help you figure out like where you're safest. Sure. Yeah, I thought about that a lot. Yeah, that's an interesting comparison. You know, you don't know what's going on. You just hear random noises. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't know where to be safe. Mm -hmm. Plus yeah. you're on like an open set where most of the stuff in the room is a prop. So even if you want to go in the little office with a door, none of that's real. It's right. like this huge open space. There's really nowhere to go and run and hide. What are you going to do, like climb the lights in the rafters? Scary stuff. Yeah, but I did I did like these two scenes back to get back to back where we mm -hmm. see what happened to him and then it fades to him still thinking about it and pondering it and then just switching that gear and putting on his hat and his suit, you know, and then going out and performing a spectacle for the rest of the people yeah. in the audience. We see OJ uh, pick up the family live show poster and realize he realizes what's about to happen. The family live show begins, but the creature arrives early and takes everyone in the bleachers. We see the audience members struggling inside the creature. This reminds me a lot of the abduction scene in Fire in the Sky. I watched that the month after. It's like the only good part of that movie. <laughs> yes. But. Well, the rest of the movie is a great drama. Yeah. That has nothing right. to do with aliens. But that abduction sequence is still one of my favorite things. It was hard for me to not think about that as mm -hmm. I was watching this. I could totally see that. Um, this one's good, though. And it made, and it was the first time that it made the credit sequence at the beginning makes sense to me. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty horrific. I like how it cuts in the middle of that lady's scream at the very end because it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's. It, it's obvious that they're they're in trouble. <laughs> I also really I love this scene when they do get eaten by Jean Jacket, which I can say now that I know after seeing it. But at the time, you don't know they're being sucked up into something. This dust devil. Um, it's really interesting to see the inside of it. They're just like bouncing around. You don't quite know that they're being like swallowed and digested. But at the time, it, and then if you watch the bonus footage, you can see how they were filming it and bouncing Ooh, around. Yeah. But at the time, you're like, what's going on? Yeah. It was like they were in a little fun house. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's really fun. Yeah. It's a blow, it's a blow up <laughs> mouth and digestive tract. <laughs> it, it's a, which is an extremely cool take on alien abduction stuff for it to just be, it is a, it is a creature, not a ship. There aren't a bunch of little green aliens. It is a big, weird, gross, unfathomable Lovecraftian creature. Yeah. It's cool as hell. Mm -hmm. And it's hungry. And <laughs> seemingly always. And Jupe's been feeding it <laughs> Jupe's been feeding it horses and buying these horses from the ranch and then using them as bait and feeding it and using it as a show to make money and be famous. He thinks he can control the alien with or the quote unquote spaceship or whatever. And right. today it shows up early. He's like, Oh, this is unexpected. It's so <laughs> here it is early. He took all the wrong lessons from <laughs> surviving the Gordy's home incident. Yep. 
I love that he says, um, you're chosen under his breath right before he goes into the like song and dance. Yeah. Everybody He's stay like, in your seats. <laughs> and then that's when he we, he introduces us to that woman being in the audience. Yep. And then he says, my family and I have bore witness to a spectacle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The stands are so poorly filled. Yeah. It's really interesting. It's really a depressing uh-huh. display. Yeah. You know, a de- a, a really a depressing show that they're putting on. You know, even I think when the when the alien first appears or something first starts happening, people will look bored mm-hmm. and there there are hardly any people there to see it. And yeah. I think that's really effective because if you look at this quote unquote child actor who is young, he's trying to make it do this thing. He's got this weird little hokey frontier town kind of thing. The whole thing is sad because it's a little tourist trap that's really tiny. It's in the middle of nowhere. And so I think that was extremely effective because it's just mm-hmm. that's what this whole thing, this whole show is. It's just like sad and depressing and shouldn't be happening. Whether or not there was an actual alien being involved. Yeah. It's like it's the a lot of the movie feels really weird and isolated, which mm-hmm. was a weird reflection of early parts of the pandemic. So it like it the movie feels sparse and and empty, and it's hard for it was hard for me the first time I saw it, and a little bit this time to not think about how like all the hurdles that they probably had to jump through shooting it because I, the only uh, making of stuff that I saw, that was when there were still COVID protocols on movie sets. And um, it feels like a movie that was made during the pandemic and mostly in a good way, I yeah. think. And yeah, the the depressing little sideshow thing that is Jupiter's claim, it'd be like going to a theme park for night court or something <laughs> where it just like, it wouldn't be very popular right. mm-hmm. probably, but um it was, also seems to be out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. 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 It's like, it's because you see like a couple of the, the driving sequences, it's just like up in the mountains somewhere. Yeah. I guess they go to town when they go to the diner. They go to town when they go to the electronic store. Well, and, and uh, what's his face? Angel even makes like a reference to, yeah, I came all the way out here. Yep. Like just making it seem like it was like, to deliver the camera system. Or later um, on, like when... At the very end, like when that TMZ biker comes up, he's like, here, we are here in the middle of nowhere. Like, yeah. How do you get reception? And it would explain like one of my questions that I had had the first time, which was like, how did nobody else see this? It's just like, well, it's it's way out there in the in the desert. And they filmed yeah. it that way. You can see there's nothing around them. Yeah. And it's really pretty. Yeah, very. It's really pretty. <laughs> but, but the doing that little side, someone said sideshow, and that's sort of what it is. And it reminded me, in rewatching it of some of like those little uh, like carnival sideshows, they would just meander through, you know, cross country trip and just pop up here and there in these little towns. And it had this kind of like X Files y kind of little tiny vibe to me in some quiet way. Yeah. Yeah. And even when it like the, when we're first taken to Jupiter's claim, like there's some kids there, there's some people there, but it's not a ton of people. Just enough for a little bit of a snack for an for an alien. It's like the mystery <laughs> spot. It's like going to the mystery spot in Michigan yeah. where it's oh, like, this yeah. house is crooked. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Come it's to like my de- house. It's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, it's depressing and sad and weird, but you're paying money to take part in that thing. And right. so we needed that for this movie. Like These people are paying to take part of this. Yeah. They're paying to watch, yes, yeah. this horse be fed to an alien, which they don't really know. Yeah, I find Jupe so interesting. I think it's weird how much he's commodified this, like, one traumatic thing. Um, or, like, how much he's sort of commodified um, his, quote-unquote, success as a kid. Like, that's become his entire life. Like, he has mm-hmm. seemingly nothing outside. He's pulled his kids into it, and, like, in a weird uh, sort of full-circle thing, he accidentally gets his whole family killed because he can't let go. Like, he never really moved. He never accepted this thing that happened to him and moved on, and that's, like, his downfall, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I really wanted to know more about his wife. Yeah, like, why? What are you doing there? Yeah. <laughs> How did well, you get it? got these three kids. <laughs> the kids, it makes sense. Kids just want to please their parents. Like, that mm-hmm. tracks yeah. for me. But the wife, it's like, why did you enable this weird shit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just curious. I'm like, well, because we really don't see her very much, but you could tell she's a huge part of the show and the the place that they are running. 
And I, as a person who was a child star, went through this, you know, traumatic incident. I wanted to know like, at what point that they meet. Like, I just want a little backstory. It's, it's not going to be in this movie, but as a viewer, I was just like, huh, I like her dress. Huh, I wonder how they ended up together and what's the deal and at what point in his life and, you know. Yeah. Maybe she just rolled weird. in one day to Jupe's claim and just said, yeehaw. Howdy, partner. Yeah, exactly. Howdy, partner. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get a weird vibe from her because, like, she seems nice, I guess, but she's also, like, um, she's propping up the sad man. Yeah, exactly. It's weird. Like, he's like he's got his thousand yard stare or whatever. Right after he's thinking about the Gordy's home thing, and she's like, "All right, let's practice again. You gotta practice again." Yeah. And then he has like a moment of not doubt, but like a moment of hesitation during the show, and she's like, "Oh, he's putting on a real show for us." <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, and then doesn't he repeat the exact same line that she yells out? Yeah. 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 She's just like keeping the, the weird, sad parts of this going. Mm-hmm. So she's the real villain. <laughs> What's well, a family affair? Right. But should it be? None of this should be. <laughs> but yeah, here we are paying money to watch this, this thing unfold. And they all get sucked up and they're in that beautiful little fun house in the alien's mouth. Yeah. This scene wrecked me in the theater, um, especially because I saw it in July 2022. And so there was no um, like DVD or Blu-ray option. Like I went home and I was scouring. I don't have TikTok, but I was looking through the Internet to find just this scene anywhere because it was it it really um, got under my skin Um and I just find that so interesting because my instinct after I see this weird thing that I don't understand is to try and see it again. Which is exactly mm-hmm. what they're all doing. Yeah. yeah it's, yeah. Mm-hmm. I had the same thing. And yeah. the first time I watched it, I watched it at home. So I did rewatch it over and over again. Nice. Um, and it's claustrophobic and gross and, and. People are throwing up. Yeah. Yeah. It's, oh. it's very cool. <laughs> and, the sound, and the sound is cool too because yeah. then you're equating it with all the other times you've heard these murmurs of people screaming mm-hmm. that's what they were you know you're like yeah. that's what that's what they were hearing in the clouds the whole time right and these people screaming and realizing that in the moment the first time you're watching it it's cool but you're I, I don't know I this second viewing hearing those screams and stuff before you see this scene oh it makes them so much more haunting knowing mm-hmm. exactly what it is up there yeah there's also a ton of little um, things in his speech. Uh, particularly, I loved when he says, what if I told you in about an hour you'll leave here different? That, like, stuck <laughs> in my head for... Yep. And it's um, there's only one hour left in the movie. So I like put that together. Yeah. That's, oh. Mm-hmm. That's... I thought about that when I was rewatching it last night. It was about the one hour. I was like, wow, there's one hour left. Yeah. And at the end, he says, uh, so as I said, in just under an hour, Star Lasso experience is going to change you. <laughs> Bitch, it changed me. <laughs> I walked out of the theater like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a couple other cool things in that little... Um, monologue he says that um well he swears on his the lives of his wife and children which uh that Mm. came back to bite him in the ass very quickly and he says that he saw um jean jacket for the first time at 6 13 p.m um but earlier when we first meet him he says that the gordy's home incidents was six minutes and 13 seconds of like pure terror but oh. it's the exact same time what? 6 13 6 13 huh. yeah um which i find interesting and then he also says that they're being surveilled by an alien species that he calls the viewers and even though they haven't emerged from the ship he thinks that they trust him and if they didn't he doesn't think any of them would be there right now which is very on the nose, yes. but yeah, interesting. are called the viewers. Yeah, right. it's cool. I'll I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> We've got an official ruling. On the field. <laughs> we officially will allow this to go forward. You don't have to change the movie. <laughs> no, it's 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 cool. It is cool. Yeah, I just find it so interesting that like uh, she never moved on from this thing, and he's. Like, you know, he's trying to make sense of it because that's how humans work. People want to believe that there is uh, 
order to a chaotic world and that things happen for a reason. But Mm -hmm. um, he's pulling together all these clues that are really just coincidences and, uh, you know, thinking that there's something there, Mm -hmm. which I don't relate to at all. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I feel like he's also searching for the meaning and this higher purpose of what he went through and as a survivor. And then now he's doing this weird little show and his whole family's involved. And it's like he's... I know his wife is the one talking about, but he's he's partially doing it like for himself. That this is why I'm still here. He I wants think to find he's totally doing it. He for wants himself. to find the meaning of you know these viewers are here and I'm here now to give you this thing and in one hour you're going to be changed because of me. Yeah, doing this. Well, he's chosen. He's the ringleader. He he's the, the ringleader. One who survived. Mm-hmm. Um, Jordan Peele says in one of the behind the scenes thing that um, uh, he felt like. Jupe thinks that there was some sort of camaraderie between him and the chimpanzee because, um, you know, Jupe's the only Asian American person on set and all everything that goes into that. But they're both um, in their own way putting on like a front, like they're both putting on this persona that isn't necessarily them, but that's what like the film set declares them to be. Um, but then I wonder, like, does he see Jean Jacket and he's like, oh, me and this creature have an understanding because we're both like these weird outsiders that nobody mm-hmm. understands. And hmm. yeah, well, that makes weird. sense. I did feel like they had that little bond in a couple of the, that scene we have of him under the table. Yeah. Yeah. So sad. He makes his little kids into child oh. actors. <laughs> yeah. It worked so well the first time. Let's do it again. <laughs> yep. <laughs> OJ arrives to an empty Jupiter's claim. He finds Lucky and tries to convince him to run, but the creature is stalking them. Swoops down to attack, knocking OJ out. He wakes up later that night and tries to get Lucky out of there. OJ calls M to tell her what happened, but everything powers down. Angel returns to the house, and he and Emerald hear the screams of all the Star Lasso experienced folks stuck inside the creature, until they hear a crunching noise and then silence. Small objects and blood rain down from inside the creature onto the house. While this is happening, OJ becomes stuck inside his truck. He cracks open the door and looks out to see if it's safe to leave, but then sees the creature hovering directly above him, says nope, closes the door, and waits out the night inside the truck. Uh, Meanwhile, the fake horse falls through the top of the truck, piercing through the windshield. Jump scare. Woohoo! The next morning, they regain power, and OJ, M, and Angel escape the farm. I love that whole sequence. You bet. The whole thing. I absolutely. Good and gross. Just, <laughs> just amazing. Love just it. with Angel trapped in the van and that song's playing. And then it gets so warm. <laughs> like the, <laughs> the, the yeah. power powering up and down. I just, I love this whole thing. And then I don't even get me going on the blood raining. Oh my <laughs> God. That love was it. my favorite. I was dying in the movie theater watching that because I just thought it was so good. And yep. gross and good. Yep. Well. I love M in all these scenes. She <laughs> seems almost the the coolest and calmest of anybody uh-huh. while Angel's <laughs> under the table with her. He's got a knife that's like his hand is shaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, then OJ gets there eventually, and he's still calm and cool, and he's like, you know, it's an animal. It's territorial. He's always calm and cool. He thinks he's at home. He thinks he's <laughs> awesome. at home. But he's so right and smart the whole time. That's why these, I like this little group together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but just great. And it's so gross. Like you realize that they are coming from, these are, there's things falling all over the place again. This is what his father <laughs> went through. And, but it's so much grosser this time. I yeah. love it. I just, I, yeah, I have, I have no negative notes about that sequence. It's gross. It's horrifying. It's, well, then they're trying to make their big escape, too. You know, they got out of there. They got in a working car, and then they go. Um, One thing, like, in the bonus, the extra footage, they were talking about filming that scene, and there were just people off camera just, like, whipping stuff, keys. Just whipping stuff all <laughs> over the place. <laughs> it's super funny to watch because so much of this movie, they're like, we invented a brand-new technology. <laughs> you know, we spent so much money on CGI. We had all of this. And then it's just, like, two random man men, like, on the roof just... Throwing shit. Yeah, how yeah. hard it was to whip that wheelchair down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like this is the first time that I saw how like powerful Jean Jacket was because we we already know he can like suck people up. We've seen him suck up a horse before, but um, when it comes down 
uh, like super close to where OJ and uh, Lucky in that little weird box are, um, the sound by itself was so overpowering in the movie theater. It was like very freaky to me. Yeah. Don't we see the the uh, ever unfolding layers of the mouth or whatever it is here coming right above the house? Or am I mixing up the scenes? <laughs> I could not tell because it was so dark to <laughs> these scenes. I think I this. Remember. I think this is the first time that you get like a good glimpse of like what the mouth is doing. Yeah. 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 Um, there's some really great YouTube video online of the sound design of this movie. And one of the things they talk about is the screaming um, of the folks inside. They had like a group of actors pretend that they were on a roller coaster and like record what that scream would sound like. And then they told them, all right, now like scream like you're, you know, terrified. And they blended those together. Mm. So it's like both happening at once, which also reminds me of us um, later in the movie when you see the difference between the people up and down. Yeah. And I... And if you think about if you are sitting at the bottom of a roller coaster watching people on a roller coaster, that's exactly how the sound sounds. It goes, whoa. And that I was hearing that like when they when you before you know what is going on or who what's in the sky at all. And you heard that that murmuring sound. And that's what it reminded me of. It reminded me of a roller coaster sound yeah. where the sound was coming in and out. And it sounded like people were being entertained. The other thing that they mentioned in that video that was really cool to me is um, like all of the sound design is so exact. But. When Jean Jacket is around, even if you can't see him in the frame, they turn down like the noise of the bugs or like all of the background so that you can tell that something is off, but you can't quite put your finger on what's going yeah, on. It's very cool. But that sequence is also when we have OJ flashing back to don't look at the animal in the eyes. Like, don't look at it. That's when he realizes mm -hmm. and he starts putting his head down and like it's all coming together for him how he might, how they might get out of this. Just don't look it in the eye. Yeah. Man, good thing for OJ or everybody on Earth would be totally screwed. <laughs> <laughs> in any other crises, he might not be that useful. But in this, since he is so familiar with animals and cares so much about their well-being and understands them. on Because, I mean, Emerald cares for these animals, too. But OJ is there and he's there all the time, still every day, taking care of these animals. He has a, a deeper current connection with the animals than anybody else in the movie. Yeah. With these horses. Well, they even suggest earlier, like, Em's like, Yo, we gotta leave. As soon as they see it for the first mm -hmm. time, they're like, we need to leave. And he's like, no. He's like, I gotta, I gotta feed him in the morning. I got business to take care of. Yeah. It made me think about how much, um, like, because Emerald's gone, his dad is gone in a more real way, but the horses are kind of like his family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which I think really helps um, kind of uh, illustrate the motivations of that character. Mm -hmm. He says, I've got mouths to feed. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And if you think about like the non communication that you can have with animals it's you're communicating with animals but you're not verbalizing mm -hmm. and that's his that's how he wants to or is with humans too it's sort of this like non-verbal communication it's easy to do with animals so that's sort of he that it helped those animals helped raise him yeah it also um i like the scene later when they're talking to antlers and antlers is like hey why don't we use a horse as bait and angel's like no these are horse people uh -huh, exactly like, i like that a lot <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, the fake horse uh, crashes through the windshield in the exact spot where OJ's dad died earlier. Oh. So. The trio head to Angel's apartment. Antlers watches the local news report about, a, about the Star Lasso Experience incident where it's speculated to be a result of flash flooding. <laughs> the trio head to a restaurant where OJ says he thinks the creature doesn't eat you if you don't look it in the eye. They head outside and discuss what they'll do next. OJ says that the moment's about to pass. M gets a text and they return to the farm. Antlers arrives to try and get the impossible shot. OJ tells them that Jupe tried to tame a predator, but they need to enter an agreement with it instead. He also names the creature Jean Jacket. They map out their plan to get the impossible shot and start to prepare. This has such a funny scene in the movie, in my opinion, where they're in the diner. And in the background, you see that fight break out. Mm -hmm. And there's no mention of it whatsoever. Um yeah, I just, I thought it was great, funny. Maybe I shouldn't have thought it was But did you stop stuff. watching them talk to look in the background to watch the football players and see what the drama was or whatever sports people they were? Do you divert your eyes to watch that specula 
Well, a little bit, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you, know. you watch this. You watch the background spectacle. Oh. I was waiting for it to be. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, you're in my head, Amanda. <laughs> get, get out! out. Get out! Get out. <laughs> <laughs> are you curious? Sorry. Of course. Okay, this makes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm a little bit slow. Uh, yeah. We know that, you're simple. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Self-proclaimed. <laughs> right. Uh, Got it. Okay, that's great. That's cool. <laughs> But the diner, you could see them just chatting and they're glad to be alive, <laughs> kind of recapping what happened. And I love that OJ is figuring it all out and piecing it together. Yeah. And I, one of my favorite parts of the diner thing is when they're leaving and then Angel says something like, you can crash at my place because I'm not going back to that fucking monster umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> I also love, you see Antlers watch the news report and you can see that he's putting all the pieces together because M called earlier and asked if he wanted to film it. I just think that's cool. The impossible shot. And I love, too, when he gets there, the first thing he says is, there's a wheelchair on your roof. <laughs> and then he mentions how the cloud hasn't moved. And right. he clocks it immediately. Yeah. It took Angel mm -hmm. watching all that footage to come out and like realize that that was happening. He instinctually looks at it and knows that well he something walked is in wrong. with his eyes as a camera looking yeah visually, you know well plus like when the when we were when we saw him last he was just sitting there analyzing footage talking about it, the impossible shot so it's like that's all he's looking for is stuff like that i saw some random tweet that kind of goes along with what christopher was saying about that um fight outside where just instinctually we can't help but not look at it, even if doing so puts us in danger. Mm -hmm. um, I just, it's like gawking when you're in a car and you are staring at the car accident or the bad thing that happened on the side of the road. And yep. you, everyone slows down, causing more traffic and more, you know, potential bad things on the road. Yeah. Because we're gawking. We can't not look. And in, humans were terrible. Well, yes. <laughs> But also in horror movies, it's like, oh, someone knocked on the door. I got to go see who it is. Mm -hmm. Like, do you? No. No. But no. you can't help yourself. There's just no. Yeah. Yeah. yeah don't go outside. Don't go in the basement. Don't open the window. <laughs> I'll, I'll just go see. <laughs> I'll go alone. <laughs> <laughs> I also think it's so sweet that OJ names it Jean Jacket because this is like the creature that, um, M might be able to tame. Like it's her turn to mm -hmm. be part of it now. And I love that there was like no like long discussion about why. And then immediately the director's like, well, we get this jean jacket. And they just had a plan. That was it. I also love when they're outside and uh, Kiki Palmer's like, didn't I tell you he was going to come up in here with a non electrical camera? Let's go, yeah. boy. <laughs> oh, I love that. That little hand clap they do is yeah. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> they both knew it meant game on. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great because there's no way to script that out and there's no way to plan for that like you can just tell that that was just some right. magic that happened on set and they happened to get it and they probably had the cut sound because people were laughing at how many times they slapped <laughs> hands because i know that i started laughing when i saw that so <laughs> it was really cute yeah <laughs> it's really cute and i also oj has another line where he says it's going to get hungry again so just ring a dinner bell Oh. That's like his big plan. That's the, the hard plan that's being hatched is yeah. it's going to get hungry. Let's ring a dinner bell. And so this whole thing they concoct is a dinner bell. All yeah. of his thoughts have to be filtered through the ranch. Uh -huh. Oh, the dinner bell. Right. Yeah. It's about the, because it's, he's so focused on these animal metaphors. <laughs> My only other note from this was um, in the, I love the trailer of this because it gave me enough to be really interested, but not really know what the fuck was going on. But, um, Antlers uh, says the lines from Purple People Eater. <gasps> Love that. And in the trailer, it really worked for me. But I think it's just a little goofy. I here. don't like it. Yeah. It's the it's I like, like it. it's a thing that I would just cut from this movie <laughs> if it were me. Or just give him uh, give him the the like the monologue from Jaws instead of a, a sing songy thing like that. I don't know. It's like. This is very much this scene when they're all together, you've assembled your team that are going to do the thing. It's like the three guys in the boat in Jaws, mm -hmm. and then it's ruined by the people, pe purple people eater thing said by the most interesting voice I've ever heard. His voice is really great. Very interesting. Yeah. I think it would have worked if they had cut it after two lines or yes. just the very beginning. Yeah. 
that's that's how I think. But they've got. But the last line is sure looks strange to me. I know. I love the scene. They're just eating their little salads, (laughs) and then he sings that. I liked it. Yeah. If that was happening to you in real life, though, you would ask him to stop it. I would have sung along with him, and you know I would have. (laughs) That's probably that's true. Actually, come on. (laughs) <laughs> that was like a song we had the record when I was a kid and we were just like we used to like sing and dance to it <laughs> I took piano lessons in elementary school and that was one of the first songs in the little book I had nice it's the only reason I know what the fuck that is <laughs> M turns the music up loud and they start to film a TMZ paparazzi guy appears on the motorcycle and asks Emerald a bunch of questions as he films her he starts to ride towards Jean Jacket but hits an anti-electric field and crashes OJ rides off to help the TMZ reporter, who asks why OJ isn't filming this. OJ sees Jean Jacket reflected in the TMZ guy's helmet and rides away on Lucky as Jean Jacket sucks him up. He evades Jean Jacket for a while, even when Jean Jacket hovers directly over him. OJ flips up his hood, which has yellow eyes stuck on the top, and he and Lucky start off on their run. Once Jean Jacket is close enough, OJ releases the same string of pennants that was attached to the fake horse. This time, it's attached to a parachute. Jean Jacket swerves and flies up into the sky again, deterred by the pennants. Even though they believe they've already gotten the impossible shot, Antlers walks up the mountain with a handheld camera, for some reason, and films Jean Jacket as it sucks him up. Jean Jacket begins to search for the trio, pulling Emerald into the air before hiding behind the mountains again. Angel wraps himself in tarp and barbed wire before being sucked into the air and nearly consumed by Jean Jacket. Jean Jacket starts to transform into some sort of new shape or form. Emerald heads for the motorcycle while OJ mounts Lucky. OJ uses eye contact with Jean Jacket to lure the creature away from Emerald so that the motorcycle will restart and she can escape. Emerald and OJ make eye contact and she rides off with Jean Jacket following close behind. Emerald makes it to Jupiter's Claim, where she Akira slides right next to the Winking Well photo op. She unties the huge inflatable Jupiter balloon, and it rises into the sky. Emerald uses coins on the ground to power the Winking Well, and after a few tries, she lands the impossible shot as Jean Jacket consumes the inflatable Jupiter and explodes. News reporters descend on Jupiter's Claim as M stands to see OJ and Lucky silhouetted in the dust underneath the Out Yonder sign. The end. <laughs> There's a lot. No, it was, that was, all of it, that was fantastic. Yeah. And also Angel survives. Yeah, he wasn't supposed to. Yeah. Really? Yeah, he, um, I guess, sort of strong-armed uh, Jordan Peele into letting him live because there is um, a little bit of talk about there potentially being a sequel to this. No. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, you say nope? No. No. Huh. <laughs> No is a harder way of saying nope. <laughs> what if they just call it no? No, don't do a fucking sequel to it. It's fine on its own. I don't, I, you know what, dear our friend Jordan, that, please don't do that. Because just making a separate really rad thing we want to see in the movie theater. <laughs> yeah. This is amazing. I love it. This goes back to that beginning sequence where Emerald is in. She's putting on that record and you can see what OJ is doing on there. I love the song that comes on. It puts you right in that. The whole yeah. thing, and then when the sky to wake up the sky dancers, I love seeing. This is my favorite scene to see in the on the big screen. Was watching this huge desolate barren, you know, plat of dirt, and yeah. then to watch them come up with that. I could have watched that. I could have watched that for an hour. It's that would have been so like a really cool. great experiment <laughs> just to watch yeah. that for an hour with that song playing on repeat. Yep. Something magical. It's very cool. It's it's the. Jaws barrels scene <laughs> of this movie. It's 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 so great. And um the TMZ thing is a little weird uh to me. I I get that it's probably some sort of commentary, but I don't care about it personally. Yeah. Um well too, I think having the electric bike, somebody th- that was part of the like the plot device was bringing in this electric bike so you can see where the force field ended, and then also that is how um uh, what her, Emerald escapes, and she mentions motorcycles earlier. And I think also so. just having like a wrinkle to the plan, like mm-hmm. yeah, they have a plan, but an outside force kind of fucks it up immediately, mm-hmm. and then they have to yeah, kind of scramble. That, it added that tension. 
I liked how menacing the motorcyclist was. Mm-hmm. You know, you never see the person's face. They've just got one eye hole cut yeah. out <laughs> of their shield, right? Yeah. yeah. Why? It's really it's, weird. It almost looks bug-like. Yeah. I think it's mostly just to match that um, reflective thing that spooks, um, is it Goat? No, Lucky on the film set earlier. Right. Yeah. Um, it's supposed to look just like that. But I also, I find it sort of effective that we never find out who that person is because it could be Good point. anyone. Right. Also, isn't it just like society today that some guy just whips out his camera and starts filming someone without getting their permission? Mm-hmm. Right. And um, I'm sure Jordan Peele experiences that in real life a lot. And oh, it's very uh, disruptive. I liked the... So we have Angel and the director. They're sort of like camouflaged among the dirt trying to get this shot while M is coordinating OJ to be this faux bait Mm -hmm. until the motorcycle guy shows up. And I like the little weird interactions with Angel and the director over there. And I liked Angel kind of like just following directions because this guy was, you know, so important Mm -hmm. and how they were using the, you know, the handheld camera and trying to crank it and change the film Right, adding the stakes of having to change the film in the mm-hmm. middle of when they would be able to get the good shot mm-hmm. is is pretty cool. And good then they're attention. like, Are you no, I don't see a camera, I don't see a monitor for his camera. And he's like, it's it's film. It's a whole thing. <laughs> it's not digital. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a whole, it's a whole a thing. Is it? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like that. <laughs> Antlers has a hood on here, which is probably to help cover his eyes from... Um, jean jacket but it also makes him look like a sith lord which i really like <laughs> i thought about that afterwards when he was just running when he wants to go off on his own to get the shot and his he's got these robes that are just like blowing all over the place and i was like wow that's a really happening now what he's got on yeah he also is wearing a skirt or a kilt or something mm-hmm. yeah it's all flowing I really like that yeah very chic you know with antlers i mean the movie is partly uh an homage to old Hollywood. You know, mm-hmm. you've got the, the old horse trainers and, you know, this long-standing tradition and you've got the reference to the, is it Muybridge mm-hmm. horse film at the beginning? Yeah. And then you've got, you know, this old film camera that doesn't rely on anything electronic. So it, and I appreciated that. I like movies that are about old Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, um, it's, I think it's part of Americana mm-hmm. and... It's part of our love affair with movies Mm -hmm. in the U.S., I think. Mm -hmm. And I will say that Haywood Hollywood Horses, that logo with the three H's on that film reel, Mm -hmm. oh, it's so good. Um, They called the TMZ guy uh, Man in Black on a white motorcycle, which I liked. Just imagining like Will Smith out there. Also credited as nobody. I guess there was some other plot element to that character that they took out. Hmm. But um, in the same discussion where they were talking about how there might one day be like a sequel or something in the same universe, I guess um, the story of nobody is like one of the things that Jordan Peele is still thinking about in the back of his Hmm. brain. Interesting. Don't do it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, At one point, Kiki Palmer also tells the DMZ guy that they're shooting a Verizon commercial. Uh Yeah. Um, And that relates to um, when they were filming Us, I guess, they went to really great lengths to keep all of the plot elements uh, under wraps. And so I guess at one point they had to film out in the world and Ian Cooper said that they were filming a Verizon commercial. Mm -hmm. I remember that. And then I remember some of the leaked set photos from that uh, made it look... Anyway, I... I love that movie, Me and too. I was very excited for that movie when it came out, and I was very excited to see what he was up to. Um, she also has a line that um, made me pause the movie and look something up, um, huh. where she says, "OJ's doing the run," and which immediately reminded me of there was an ESPN Thirty for Thirty documentary series about OJ Simpson. Oh, um, it's uh, first of all, it's the I think it's the best documentary ever made. Um, And so that documentary talks about there are two very famous runs that O.J. Simpson did. One we're all very familiar with where he was driving in the Bronco. Bronco. And then the other one was what made him famous and what what made him a spectacle and such a household name. It was from, I think, a 1967 USC game. It was what ultimately won him the Heisman Trophy. 
and made him a household name and made him just the most famous person in the world at that time. Huh. If you Google it, there are some there are a lot of articles about the run. I'm putting quotes around that. If you watch it in real time, it doesn't look very special. But like at the time it was like the fastest anybody had ever seen a college football player run and and dodge people. So it turned him into a spectacle. Huh. And then later Really, if you search O.J. Simpson the run, you're going to see a lot of footage of the Bronco because that's the other one. So that little line, I'm sure, Mm -hmm. was in reference to O.J. Simpson being this huge spectacle for two very different scenarios. That's interesting. Um, I didn't know that, but I love that. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. And and the only (laughs) the reason I pause it is. There, th- there is a line in the documentary where they're t- where there's a now disgraced journalist who's talking about like if you ask somebody where they were when when the when the run happened, um, everybody would remember would remember that game because it yeah mm-hmm. anyway, uh, so that's just a cool little little line that's in there. That's um, wild. Yeah, I did not see that mentioned in any of the bazillion things that I read about that. So it's, that is fascinating. It's really, really low in the user contributed things on IMDb. I just I actually found that while we were recording. Really, um, but there's no way that it's not referencing that because no, totally. O.J. Simpson, again, once upon a time, it's like he was beloved, and I recommend to all three of you and anybody listening to this, if this even makes it in the episode, please watch that ESPN documentary about him because it's an incredible commentary on celebrity, uh-huh. race relations in the United States specifically, and um, and he definitely fucking did that shit. Oh, yeah, There's no absolutely. question that he did that shit. Yeah. Um, I also love the line uh, right at the beginning where that actress is like, your name is OJ? She's like, yes, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perfectly vapid. Yeah. That actress OJ is OJ Made someone. in America? Yep, that's the one. Yep, it's a, it's, it's either four, I think it's five parts. Um, and uh, it's just mm-hmm. terrific. Here's a, I just, quick Google search and the audience review says, OJ Made in America is a super litty movie for peeps to watch if they are bored. A what? what? <laughs> I think a, a Super, Gen Z. Yeah, exactly. A super litty movie for peace to watch up there. This is somebody who says, let's go. <laughs> um, my 19-year-old co-worker taught me the other day what Riz is. Never even what? She's a character in Gre- Greece. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that's what that's, all the kids are saying. All the kids, or, are, or the rat, all the kids the just mouse, cut on to Greece. All the, Riz- the Rizzo. <laughs> it's short for Rizzo. Yeah. Rizzo the rat? <laughs> I don't know. This doesn't have anything to do with anything, but I love that OJ tries to help the TMZ guy, and then when he sees the reflection, he just says, my bad, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. I did like the the shot when Antlers is being sucked up. I did like that he was still like fiercely trying to get get it on film. Right. And I I liked that we were seeing his point of view where his legs were flying upwards. So I thought that was because we've seen the people inside of the mm-hmm. entities internal area Mm -hmm. so i like that we got this other point of view i thought that was really cool and i also really liked separately when angel and antlers were in that little camouflaged area and angel says it's here Mm -hmm. like the little girl and poltergeist so that was a nice little it's cheesy and overdone but i i loved it here right so am I mistaken or do we see a sort of film canister come out and roll down the hill after Antlers gets sucked His up? camera does. Yep. Okay. You're so right. The camera. Whole, yeah. Okay. We see it laying there. I right. think you're right though. Like, I don't think they have any footage from yeah, that. Yeah. Right. I think they, I think they, they really quickly try to point out like he didn't get it. Okay. Yeah. They're not going to be able to recover this, yeah. which, which puts all that importance on the, the wink and well. Right. Which M didn't know that any of that had happened, so she, she was still getting yeah. that shot too. Right. The Wink and Well thing is interesting because, in her own way, she um, creates a series of images that can be um, transformed into a little motion picture, mm-hmm. just like mm-hmm. her ancestors. Right. Wow. 
Huh. But also, she was the one at the beginning who was so intent on getting the Oprah shot. Mm-hmm. And here she is at the end that still, yep. she didn't let that, because that was their mission. That was their goal, mm-hmm. was to get it. And she, uh, she tames him <laughs> really <laughs> forcefully. <laughs> and so by this point, we've now seen the, like, I don't know if it's a true or just alternate form of jean jacket. So yeah. fucking oh, cool. Yeah. Went from being like, okay, fine, it's a saucery looking thing that kind of sometimes looks like a sheet. Um <laughs> <laughs> to then like, oh, it's this that's when it's like, oh, it's like a Lovecraft creature. Mm-hmm. Or apparently it's I am not an anime person, but apparently no. it's a reference to Neon Gen- Genesis Evangelion. Yeah, that. I don't know what that is either. I don't either. Yeah. I recognize that the Akira, Akira shot. I, was like, I recognize oh. that. I thought, yeah, I thought it was really cool. I didn't understand that. That was one of the two things. Again, me and the first person I was discussing with was the 13-year-old I watched it with <laughs> was the Gordy scene, the whole mm-hmm. Gordy scene, and then what happened to it? Why did it change shape? How did it go from a ship and now it's a thing and it's a flower? But it's like a metamorphosis if you think about it. Right. But that or was one thing I really off. wanted to figure out <laughs> was like, is it the same thing or is it a different thing? Yeah, because then it, that's when it's doing that weird thing with its oh, mouth it's when like it's interacting with stuff. Yeah, it's cool. That that's when the effects were like, all right, I like these effects. Mm-hmm. I wasn't convinced with that first form, but that might have been. A, I'm guessing that was on purpose because by the time they show you that, it's it's very cool. Yeah, well, it's got to look like a ship. For all of the beginning part of the movie. Yeah. For that misdirect. But after this, it goes back to looking like a ship. Yeah, we see right. it reform it goes in back. the distance. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I did really like, I liked the ending where she gets, oh, Emerald gets that Oprah shot, the money shot, and then she's so pumped up. And if her brother was there, they would have been in that little clap together. I mean, I guess he was there, but standing there, then she's like, nobody fucks with Haywood because she won. Ooh, she yeah. killed She killed him, and she got the shot. So it was just a complete. But then I also wonder at the end when, like, the dust literally clears and you see that out yonder, and mm-hmm. then there is OJ on the horse. And then when I saw it in the movie theater, I was like, is he alive or is he dead? I had the same thought. And I think that's I part know of that's the takeaway. I know that's on purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, so Very powerful. My immediate assumption is out yonder, he's dead. That was also my first instinct, although I hate that. Yeah. I thought, so the first two times I watched it, I thought he had died. And I did the same thing. Like, I went home and tried to look it up and seeing is he alive? Is he, but again, you're not supposed to know. They're not going to say, yes, he's dead. No, he's not. Um, oh, he's alive. I'm. But then <laughs> last night after watching it again, there's the thing where, Emerald is standing there and she sees him and then she closes her eyes for a really long time thinking if I open them up and he's there, he's alive. And if I, he's, if I open them up and he's gone, he's dead. But if I open my eyes, eyes up and he's still there, he's alive. Cause like when you see, your, you see a ghost or something and she had her eyes closed for a real time. And then the look on her face when she opens them again, I'm like, okay, he's alive and he's still there. I think so too. That was my interpretation when I watched it again. I also, both times I watched it for this, was paying such close attention to how much time passes in between when we see that weird green eye thing um, and we see, you know, OJ uh, backing up. I don't think there's really enough, because we see that it has to literally like engulf the balloon, like it eats it. It doesn't suck it up like before it like has to be physically near it. I don't think there's enough time for it to have um, eaten OJ and then also be chasing Emerald. Mm-hmm. Well, plus he was right. messing around with eating Angel and he had an Angel wrapped himself in that blue tarp and that um, chicken wire or what is it called? The yeah, the barbed, barbed, barbed wire. wire. That was genius. Yeah, I like that. And then so he's still just roaming around the field somewhere. Before I had watched this, I, I saw that there is this article that says, Nope, secret, nope secretly confirms that he really survived. Because, <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah. And it's this, it's a, it's a long scroller. And it's like, a, if, if you really understand the movie, you understand that he survived. You know what? Which is just like, fuck you. We're not yeah. reading that. <laughs> Don't even bring that to the table. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but that, apparently he does survive. Is that a bored panda classic? <laughs> <laughs> it's from Screen Rant. Oh, perfect. Um, that nobody fucks with Haywood bitch line. I didn't really think anything of it until the rewatches for this. And I kind of wonder, like, um, you know, sh- she has heightened emotions because the super intense thing happened. But also this is like in a weird way revenge for what or like payback for what happened to her dad. I wonder yeah, if she's thinking about that. Yeah, it's her name. Totally. She doesn't mention her. It was a group. 
it was Haywood, her family and her family name. Mm -hmm. Also interesting that she uses coins to power the Winkin well, and it's a mm. coin that killed her dad in the right. beginning. Mm -hmm. Just like balloons popping, start the Gordy's home incident, and then he eats and the then I didn't, pick oh, up I didn't on even that. put that together. God yeah. fucking damn it. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. All right. <laughs> oh, That's the way. beauty of the rewatch. <laughs> There's so much weird depth that you can only get to on your fourth watch. <laughs> Four so, times, Allison? I'm curious, how much of all these illusions were there from the very beginning in uh, in uh, Jordan Peele's mind and how much evolve as he's making the movie and or even you know someone else says hey let's make it this because it's a cool reference over here yeah. you know probably both because in the behind the scenes they talk about how collaboratively he works right but you saying that reminded me that um, some random BuzzFeed article I happened upon has a 2014 tweet from Jordan Peele that reads, dreamt that a baby chimp attacked some people, then ran to me and hugged me all scared. I woke up with tears streaming down my face. Hashtag, bruh. Huh. I also, 2014? 2014. Wow. I also read an interview where he also had ideas for like the alien in the movie by listening to that the song that plays when they were waking up the Sky Dancers. Mm -hmm. I'm forgetting, I have a written here somewhere but the song if you listen to the song um exuma the obium man returns by tony mackey mm -hmm. he heard that song when he was younger and he'd never heard it before and it just blew him away and he was just going he had this whole experience of like the song has existed for so long and i never knew it existed and they heard it and he couldn't unhear it and so i think part of the idea or the visuals or something came into his head from that too that song is um it also plays <laughs> menu screen of the DVD, but it was also in the trailer. It's a great song. Do you guys watch trailers? Yeah. I <laughs> yeah. It depends Never. on the movie. Yeah. Ever. It if, does depend, yes. If, if it's something that I absolutely want to know nothing about going in, because sometimes trailers really do have spoilers. I kind of waffle back and forth because sometimes I'll be, someone will know I like a director or a style or something, and they'll know I'm excited for a movie to come out, and they'll send me the trailer. Like, when it launches, it's like, first of all, I already know it's going to launch because I already know, and I'm purposely avoiding it. And so sometimes I will watch them, and sometimes I won't watch them. I'm very particular. I did watch this one, though. Yeah, and I thought it was a western with aliens. I watched this one because I had a feeling it was going to be cryptic and teasery. Yeah. It's not like like I've been uh, obviously a very different kind of movie, but I've been trying to avoid the new Indiana Jones ones because I don't want to mm -hmm. know too much about what that's going to be about, even if it ends up not being great. Right. Um, I just I know that they kind of have to show you a lot of stuff to get you interested, whereas with this they could just show you like six people's faces right. looking yeah. up. Yeah, if which there's is something I don't care about, I'm more apt to watch the trailer. Like if it's something that I fo like if the stuff that's in the MCU. Like I don't like watching uh. trailers for that. It's <laughs> yeah. something that I followed. I don't. It's not my favorite thing in the world, but I. Sure. I invested in watching all of them well you have to and, at this point and i don't want to see a trailer if you want to understand I don't anything want to see a that's trailer. happening in any of them yeah <laughs> yeah just rewatch six movies and then go see the next one yeah um, do you all do you avoid trailers oh, yeah. christopher yeah sometimes tyra watch uh, well will watch a trailer right before the movie that she's watching <laughs> you know and it's like <laughs> <laughs> what are you coming doing? Coming soon, Nan. <laughs> yeah, literally coming soon. Coming in coming immediately. five minutes yeah. <laughs> to your television. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Disagree. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've, I leave the room. I don't want to see any bit of it, ever. Well, the other thing, man, modern trailers are, are, I know this makes me sound like they don't make them like the used to kind of person, which I fucking hate, but... Modern trailers do that thing where they say trailer starts in. So it's a little preview thing before the fucking trailer starts. And then they all do the same like sound in yeah. them. Oh, that was good, man. And they <laughs> and they will play like a like sparse version of a song that you've heard before with just like a single piano sound. I fucking hate modern trailers. Yeah. Perfect this one people eater. Don't. That oh man oh it's that like, yeah we've heard the nursery yeah. rhymes rhyme slowed down but it's down. whispered or something yeah. or it's done in a children's singing voice which uh, yeah sensodyne <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> sensodyne yeah. yeah but yeah. the modern trailer is a whole thing like 
the, what, the day the trailer's coming out is on people's calendars. And then, you know, two months later, they do the extended or the real trailer. There's the a tra- There's trailer. trailers for the trailers. <laughs> yes. Yes, you get the it's yeah. out of control, and you get three different versions of it, and it and it's bled over from movies into video games yeah. and into other things, and it, and they're all they all drop. They aren't yeah. released; they're dropped. They're, yeah, exactly. But like some Beyonce. of them I do get excited. Like, was it? Some, it was like Cobra Kai or Stranger Things. Like, I watch those trailers, and I get real excited about those when those come yeah. out. Maybe it's only yeah. for TV shows that I can do it for. But you get one trailer where that's like a, you know a, a minute, then you get the one that's like three minutes, and you're like, oh my god. Yep. But you I'm, feel like you already watched the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm waiting for season three of Abbott Elementary trailer. You'll <laughs> <laughs> never guess what happens. Right. <laughs> um, I guess some of the footage in the I loved the trailer for this because I didn't feel like it gave too much away, which Mm-mm. is like Not the standard all. now. Yeah. But I guess um a lot of the footage in the trailer wasn't in the movie. That's and they do that purposefully with some with some movies and not others. Like I know that they've they've done that with some of the Marvel stuff where they'll make you think that somebody's in trouble who isn't or somebody's yep, yep. Oh, yeah. It's it's a it's an interesting tactic. One yeah. um shot that really got me in the trailer and it still got me in the movie is when Emerald sucked up into the sky at one point at this in this final confrontation. Mm-hmm. Oh fuck, I don't want to be sucked into the sky. How did like, both of her legs not fucking break though? Whew. That like when she fell, she hit hard. From like 30 feet in the yeah. air, 40 feet in the air. Yeah. yeah, that was wild. Yeah. OJ and his sister do the same like eye gesture, like pointing at both their eyes, mm-hmm. which I thought was cool. They're also, um, OJ's wearing an orange Scorpion King sweatshirt and Mm -hmm. Emerald's wearing a green outfit. Which apparently were the school colors of the nearby high school. Oh, really? Yeah, it's something I read in the Go Tigers! (laughs) (laughs) I don't want to know that, though. I did, I loved all of Emerald's outfits and her colors and her jeans and her little... Oh, yeah, she had that cool Jesus lizard. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 I was also wondering how she got that. From, they had, from Angel. Were those his pants, too? I'm like, those are really great pants. How does he have those pants, the belt and everything? Because they ran away and then ended up in the diner, and then they went to his house to right. stay for the <laughs> umbrella monster. Didn't even put that all together. Because she's always so, like, cutely. She's supposed to be, like, schlubby, but it's always cute and put together. Yeah. Like those, like, sport shorts and, like, these cowboy boots. And she's just, like, you know, watching the videotape of the horses. I don't know. Love yeah. it. She Love had great it. Style. I really, yeah, I really like those two characters a lot. Um, the movie starts <laughs> with the footage of the Jackie on the horse, and it ends with OJ on the horse, and then the credits start orange and they fade to black, just like a sunset or mm. film developing. I noticed that this time. Um, smart, smart, smart. Pretty, pretty cool. Uh, after the credits, there's also an ad for Jupiter's Claim, the new addition to the Universal Studios Hollywood Tram Tour, and I would like to go right now. <laughs> <laughs> Is it real? Yeah, it's real. They rebuilt the set. Yeah. Oh. I don't think I sat through the credits for either of the two times I watched it on Blu-ray. I'm always, because of fucking Marvel, I'm always afraid I'm going to miss some little yep. thing now. So I sit through them a lot for no fucking reason. But The only other thought I have about this is... Um, I really like that they can't rely on technology to save them because like every other sci-fi movie, it's like, we're going to need a bigger boat. We're going to need a bigger Mm -hmm. gun. We need a space shuttle to fly the bomb to the moon or whatever. And in this one, they like don't have any access to technology. Yeah, it's it's a giant inflatable big boy flying through the sky. And it has those flags on it too. Right. (laughs) Um, I have enjoyed seeing the imagery of the cloud with those color flags and like costumes and yep. like yeah. yeah, yeah. There was a luminary at full moon that was that. Oh, nice! Because really? the theme was UFOs. Nice. And I saw it and yelled out, "No!" <laughs> Made me so happy. <laughs> this is a this was a really good movie. I loved so much of it. I was, I I loved when it came out. I was mm-hmm. thrilled, and I I will watch whatever Jordan Peele puts out. This I yeah especially it, if it's horror Jason it's whatever he's doing and I don't know how many more he's going to do that are in this um, social commentary that he's doing yeah. it's phenomenal and I think it's just a huge part of like cinematic history and just having these films exist and what they speak and how people continue to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and digest totally and 
I think he has a lot to say, and I'm just excited to see, you know, what else comes from him. Well, and he has, it's like he's giving a lot of opportunities to, to like, people in the industry to, to, for sets to be much more inclusive. Like, it is a, it, he's doing big things. And this immediately made me want to go back and watch Get Out and Us. Mm-hmm. And, like, I don't, the the Fablemans did not make me want to go home and watch Jaws necessarily, <laughs> you know. like it I, did it? No. Well, I mean, it did, but but not because I was like, fuck, yeah, the Fablemans was awesome. No. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Stephen. No, I, that movie was a little bit of a bummer, but I did. I like movies about movie making. Yeah, I do, and too. I grew up with Steven Spielberg, so I'm just a sucker. I wanted to like that movie more than I did. Same. But I was still, it didn't feel long to me. I was happy to watch it, but I just felt like, okay, that was cool to watch, you know. Yeah. Um, the magic, though, the magic left Spielberg's movies for me a while ago, like a yeah. long time ago. Basically, when he changed cinematographers in two thousand two, because mm-hmm. then they all kind of started to look the same. Like really, they all started to look like War of the Worlds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Lindsay Ellis has a great YouTube video comparing uh, the two thousand five War of the Worlds to Independence Day in the nineties, and talks about like the cultural differences and why those movies are so different. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's amazing. I've also seen the War of the World set because it's part of the tram tour at Universal oh. Studios. <laughs> oh. I need to, need to go to Universal this. Studios. That's I cool. Think, yeah, I'll, it is cool. Yeah. They have an entire plane broken apart and it's like smoking and stuff. It's that's amazing. Cool. Yeah, that's cool. Mm. <laughs> that's really cool. All right. Are we ready to rate this thing? I think we are. For some reason, our rating of quality is one out of ten and our scare meter rating is out of five. So when I first saw this movie, I came out with a another movie that I remember from childhood that I thought was a good comparison. And this is really not to slag Nope at all. But I thought this was kind of like a modern version of Escape from Witch Mountain. <laughs> which the is original? a original? Mo- yeah. <laughs> which is a movie that I loved as a kid. So it's really a favorable comparison. It's not super scary, but it's a kind of adventure with a few horror and scary elements to it. So I give it a one on the scarometer, especially the scene in the horse barn. I really, really like that, and I thought it was really effective and just a lot of fun. For the rating for the movie, I'm going to give this an eight. I think there are a few problems with it. Mostly that I did feel it was slightly dull upon rewatching. However, the movie is just so chock full of amazing references and cool things to think about that it actually kind of uh, brings it back up to an eight. So I don't even remember what I've rated anything else in the podcast. I'm looking at it right now. Eight is uh, pretty high. You also gave an eight to... <laughs> you rate... Historically, you rate the Hi. orphanage higher than the rest of us. Yes, I do. <laughs> wait, wait, what did I give an eight to? The orphanage. <laughs> wait, Which think, was everyone's favorite movie. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we need to go back and like tweak the ratings. <laughs> we can do a, re- a revisionist episode at some point where we go, where we go back and rethink this. I, I will also give this an eight out of ten um, in terms of overall score. It is... My least favorite of the Jordan Peele movies, but boy, is that a high bar. I had a lot more fun watching it the second time around. I only saw it once before this, and I didn't really dig into all the lore and all of the references and stuff. So it was um, a lot of them were fresh and new to me, and a couple of scenes were brand new to me because I slept a little bit the first time I watched it. Um <laughs> Sorry, Jordan. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I really, I, but I love your movie. Um, the idea of your UFO being a creature, that is very fucking cool. And I imagine that a lot of people are going to copy that in some way, shape, or form. For the scare meter, I agree it's not, it's not particularly scary. I definitely wasn't scared the first time I saw it. I was... I can see more things to be scared of knowing what is happening. Uh, But I'm going to give it a two, if only because the idea of a chimpanzee going nuts in a studio and killing somebody, that that shit's really scary. And also the sound of 
like the disembodied sounds of people screaming mm-hmm. up in the clouds. It's an unnerving sound to hear at Cedar Point. It's an unnerving sound to hear out in the desert. Um, so I'll give it a two in terms of scare meter. I have flopped my my scores for these, and I don't know what I'm going to say even now as I'm saying it. Um, we are all in suspense. I guess for this <laughs> scarometer, I'll give it a one. I don't. If there wasn't anything that was particular scary in your typical sense of something that's scary. I did, after having watched the whole thing, I did the scenes with Gordy. Those were so haunting, not just visually because with the blood, that's the gore you see. Even some of the conversations we've had about like what chimpanzees can do, it's less of a, it's more real than a, like a, a fantasy so I did really, I think the Gordy scenes added to that. And I think, of course, we, and we talked about this throughout the, our conversation today was just that the scariness being the sense of the unknown and what's out there and not knowing what it is. Um, but it also it was sort of tempered by these, this beautiful imagery and cinematography and this banter with these siblings. I, I love this movie. I thought it was very well done. Not very scary. Um, for my ranking, I was looking at what my, previous rankings for some of the other movies we've talked about are which i hate because when i watch movies i rate them on a five point scale and i gave this movie a five out of five but i almost i don't want to give this a 10 out of 10 because 10 out of 10 just seems way different to me than a five out of five and i will <laughs> fight this every time we have to do these <laughs> weird rankings um i'll give it i'll give it an eight and a half which is a random um i i think it's a great movie i don't i don't ha- have any complaints i don't have any complaints about the dialogue or the actors or what it visually looked like, the story being told, what I understood and what I didn't understand, what I was supposed to get and didn't get, doesn't matter. Beautiful film, very well done, and I think it's a great one, and I want to see what Jordan Peele is going to do next. I still think Get Out is the favorite of the three, but they're all kind of hovering around the same little... For me, Like I was trying to think if I wanted to rate these three, what order would I put out, you know, put Get Out us and nope in and i still think get out was that first one and just super impactful with the story and i know we're not discussing that movie today um but yeah i'll go eight and a half i'll go eight and a half nice. but i loved it i i'm going to take a break from watching it i do love it and i feel like we had some weird comments <laughs> here and there but part of it is that the the spectacle of watching it for that first time and feeling and not knowing what's out there and then you see it differently because you already know even it's different than Jaws because I feel like that was more there's le- that was more entertaining, more dialogue. It was just a little campier. Where this was, it's it's taking in the same piece of art over and over, and it's nice to let it sit. And I really can't believe I watched this three times in the past nine months. And it's probably gonna be a long time before I watch it again, but that doesn't mean that I don't. I'm still gonna give it eight and a half as a as an amazing film. And I was really really glad that I broke my out of my COVID bubble in the summer of 2022 and saw it at the movie theater. Nice. It was well worth it. Um, well, I'm biased as fuck, but I'm going to give it a 10. <laughs> Woo! Whoa, is that a first? I think that's a first for the podcast. No. No, we Alien. We alien. Oh, duh. Yeah. That ruined everything, yeah, yeah, yeah. Matt. It ruined everything. <laughs> because, all... I, because I picked too good of a movie. <laughs> yeah. We all went really high. We, all four of us gave it a 10. <laughs> well, well, did. Wow. I didn't know that. Amanda gave it all of the points out of all of the <laughs> points because she didn't like the scale. <laughs> Here 30 out of 30. <laughs> <laughs> five out of five, I'd do. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I love this movie. Uh, it, like, totally works for me and is, like, uh, you guys know me. I love, like, a good 10-hour research set. <laughs> <laughs> and this gave me a lot to think about, um, so I really enjoyed that. It also just, frankly, made me excited to, um, like, watch a movie again, which is something I haven't really Mm -hmm. experienced in a while. And not only that, but to go to the theater, which I never, ever do. Mm -hmm. And, um, like, I was so jazzed about this. I went to the theater alone, which I especially never do. Um, Paid money for it. Like, all of this is so unlike me. But I was really, really excited for this. And I feel like it paid off. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, I'm giving it a 10. I really love this movie. Um, and I like that there's enough depth there that rewatching it isn't totally, um, totally boring. Like there's, uh, I, I feel like I came across a new idea or came away with mm-hmm. something I hadn't thought about every time I rewatched it. 
Um, and I'll give it a two out of five for the scarometer. Um, I don't. I, I found very little of this actually scary, with the exception of the abduction scene at the Star Lasso experience, which haunted me for like a week after. I was obsessed with it. Couldn't find it online, and just um, like really wanted to see it again to process it. It was so different from everything I've. Uh, watched previously and it really uh, really got to me so a two for basically that scene alone the rest of it was um, not too spooky to me yeah but two out of five and ten out of ten for me well if you like what you heard today and you want to let us know you can email us at what scares us at aadl.org thanks for joining us this has been what scares us